Okay, welcome. Thank you for joining us for the fifth Green Team's final presentations. This year we have an outstanding group of students who have overcome incredible challenges to complete the projects they're presenting to you today. And I'm so excited for you to hear about their projects. Um, they are spectacular. So for those of you that don't know, the Green Teams program started in 2016 with a generous grant from the PSEG Foundation. I created the program to serve a wide diversity of students, communities, and corporations and corporations in their attempts to achieve a greener world. So far, including the current cohort, we've had 210 students go through the program, coming from 34 colleges and universities and more than 70 majors. They have worked with 26 organizations and have completed 144 projects. Today, you will hear from several speakers representing high-level connections to sustainability through business, policy, global communities, and the environment. And you will hear about new uses of technology and new environmental analyses and in food security, urban agriculture, and food waste from our six 2020 Green Team students. We hope that you will follow up if you're interested in hosting a team for summer of 2021. We have some funding to help with this or would like to apply to be a student or to train students or to use any of our publicly available outcomes. Now, I'd like to hand it over to the chair of our executive advisory board, Kyle Tafuri, the director of sustainability at Hackensack Meridian Health, a large New Jersey-based hospital system that won an incredible 43 sustainability awards this year, including two hospitals being top 25 in the country. One of those hospitals received the top 25 honor for the seventh year in a row, one of three hospitals in the country to receive that honor. And the entire health system received top 10 in the country for safer chemicals and environmentally preferable purchasing. And they just received the top tier EPEAT award. It's great to have Kyle Tafiri with us this morning. Kyle, I'm handing it over to you now. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, so first off, I wanted to thank the students uh, as well as Amy for, for all the hard work they put in this summer, especially given uh, the circumstances of everything going on. If, it, if COVID and everything else wasn't a challenge, getting hit with a hurricane the day before, um, you know, they're going to present was, was very tough. So, you know, firsthand over the past several months working in healthcare, I have been able to witness what teamwork is able to accomplish uh, when you're faced with a crisis. Obviously, this digital territory is new for a lot of people, so it makes these projects that you're about to see that much more impressive that students who never really met each other in person had to work virtual throughout this were able to come together and address real world challenges uh, for the organizations that they partnered up with. So. Um, to the students, you're already ahead of the game because for the foreseeable future, a lot of the work that we're going to be doing will seem to be on this type of platform. So you're already ahead of the game. Um, something that I wanted to stress really for everybody, uh, especially with the students, is the importance of mentoring. Uh, obviously, when events like this are held in person, there's a different type of interaction, which uh, makes networking and introducing ourselves much easier um, because at the end of the day relationships are how we're going to drive this work forward and I was extremely ex fortunate throughout my career to have a number of great mentors within sustainability and, and just professionally uh, one of whom you'll hear from shortly and if we're not sharing what we're learning with the sustainability field you know, we may as well just pack it in and give it up uh, because it's going to be through these collaborations, networking, mentoring, helping these younger um, folks really get through all the challenges that they're going to be facing. Um, so I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker who allowed me to disrupt the, the very status quo that all of these uh, students you'll see will be doing. Um, Jose Lozano, who's probably had one of the most profound impacts on my career, um, really helped me when I first got to Hackensack University Medical Center. Uh, I met him when he was became our CEO's chief of staff, 
um, through really Jose's support, we were able to accomplish all those things. Uh, I think Amy mentioned something like 42, 43 awards this past year. Um, a lot of that foundation was laid through Jose's support in allowing us to become a, a leader. So uh, Jose is the president and chief executive officer of Choose New Jersey, the state's principal nonprofit economic development organization. Um, Jose has had a success in a number of different areas, whether it was uh, being the chief of staff at the EPA to Lisa Jackson, uh, the chief of staff at Hackensack Meridian Health, and now uh, especially in his role with really helping build economic development in New Jersey. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, you to Jose Lozano. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, Kyle, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, I actually wish I was in person to hear many of your presentations, um, but uh, unfortunately the COVID world has kind of uh, made that quite complex these days. I hope you're all safe and well during this crazy storm that just happened yesterday. Uh, congratulations to all of you graduating today from the Green Team programs. And as Kyle said, I lead a not-for-profit economic development organization called Choose New Jersey. Uh, and we promote New Jersey as the best place to do business, both domestically and internationally. We do this by showcasing our top universities, such as Montclair State, and by pointing out to our highly educated workforce. And New Jersey invests significantly in our students from pre-K through graduate school. And that's why we have the number one public school system in the US and we're home to the largest concentration of scientists and engineers in the country. Not only are New Jersey's higher eds filling the talent pipeline, they're also also producing world-class research and innovation that we're here celebrating here today. This combination is important for our innovation ecosystem and forward thinking companies are investing in next generation sustainability. Uh, and, and it's not because it's a buzzword or it's cool, it's because it's the right thing to do. Um, and they're looking for talent like all of you, the Green Team members, to help them out in doing so. The work that the Green Team is doing helps us envision and implement these new practices for what, a better future. And I was beyond impressed to learn that since the Green Team's launched five years ago, the program has placed hundreds of college students in internships and completed over 200 projects. I know that the Green Team's work that's finding solutions in companies like Prudential and Honeywell and Bristol Myers Scribb and American Water and Hack and Segment, many of them which my team works with on a daily basis as we work to build a stronger economic development strategy in the state and, and attract companies to New Jersey. The PSENG Sustainable Living Institute is building partnerships that support New Jersey's clean energy goals. And if you haven't known, but New Jersey is one of the few states committed to 100% clean energy by 2050. And in order to reach this goal, we're making significant investments in solar, wind to reduce the carbon emissions and maximize job creation. In 2019, New Jersey announced the development of an 1100 megawatt wind farm off of the coast of Atlantic City, or said a Danish company um, was selected to develop the project with PSENG in the largest ever offshore wind procurement by, the, by any state in the United States and it will provide power for over a half a million homes. Announced last month, New Jersey is also building the nation's largest offshore wind program, uh, I'm sorry, uh, wind port off of Salem County, which will create thousands of jobs. It's no wonder that the governor was named the greenest governor in America. And New Jersey has been, and will continue to be a true leader in the environmental movement. And Montclair itself has a long has long uh, been a leader in sustainability. In fact, Montclair State became the first educational institution in the country to sign an MOU with the EPA in 2009, committing to utilize the latest and greenest technology in the 246 acre on the campus. And I know it well because I was at EPA during that time. This year's green team projects have focused on everything from climate change to carbon emissions to food security and I know food waste. These are major complex issues affecting our society. They need our attention now, but not, it, and it cannot be solved in one day or by one person or one single approach. Collaboration and diversity is key. Diversity fosters creative solutions that drive innovation. And New Jersey is the fourth, if, for folks that don't know, New Jersey is the fourth most diverse state in the country with a long history of welcoming people from all walks of life. 
we're home to the third largest population of foreign born residents and New Jersey, just a few miles away from the campus is considered the most diverse city in America. And our immigrant workforce is ranked number one overall and number three in innovation. Our diversity is what keeps us competitive and what's what helps us makes us stronger. The Green Teams program is structured to recognize all of these values and most multidisciplinary group work STEM majors working side by side in humanity majors, bringing it all together in different skill sets and perspectives to find these solutions. You know, it's widely known that the groups like these produce the best results. That's why there was such a great, uh, great significant investment that by the National Science Foundation to recognize green teams with a $2.6 million grant. This funding goes towards making STEM education and STEM workforce placement more inclusive and especially for the Hispanic community and students. Green teams produce career ready graduates from all backgrounds. And, and these students learn professional skills far exceeding the traditional academic programs alone. In short, green team interns represent some of our best and our brightest students. I encourage the companies that are here today to strongly consider hiring these exceptional students after they graduate if you're able to. I hope that the graduates will stay here and begin their careers in New Jersey. Because in order to do so, it, it's what is actually what builds that strong fabric for New Jersey. And, and then it allows New Jersey to remain the leader in sustainability. We need all of your talents. Your creativity, your passion, and your commitment is what will better future all, for all New Jerseyans and around the world. We're going to need all hands on deck to combat the climate change and set us forward on a path for a more sustainable for tomorrow. You know, during my time at EPA, I learned about the history and the bipartisanship about environmentalism. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the EPA being created. And I had the most amazing honor of standing with President Obama on, at the agency's 40th birthday while, uh, while I was serving as Deputy Chief of Staff. He did an all hands meeting with the entire agency and he emphasized that environmentalism should not be political in any way. And actually, many of you may not even know, but EPA was recreated by a Republican president. And the two most signal, single pieces of legislation that created the EPA, the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act, which are really the foundations, were both created by Republican administrations. So regardless of what political party you are, we, have all, we all have a stake in the future of our planet, and we need it to protect it to ensure its longevity. I cannot overstate the significance of being politically engaged. The work you do is so important, but also the single best way that you can affect change is by voting. Having your voice heard shapes the important policies and decisions that impact our generations, the generations before us, the generations now, and the generations ahead. I'm confident that the Green Team students here today will go on to do amazing things and will correct our course. I know you're looking at the current economic market and it's a bit daunting, I understand. Trust me, keep doing what you're doing. Turn this passion you have into something that distinguishes you from the rest. Especially in these uncertain times, we need innovative thinkers willing to look outside the box and to lead by science. What you all have learned through this incredible program sets you apart. And this experience will help you give the tools you need to start your career on the right foot. So congratulations. But I leave you with five very simple takeaways that has helped me get to where I am today. One, lead with your heart and use your head to figure out how. Two, find a really good mentor that shares your passion and that, will, that you can use as a sounding board. Three, life is full of curveballs and impediments. Stay focused. Four, first impressions. I can't overstate the importance. Always be prepared and never wear sneakers through an interview. No one really likes it unless you're planning to invent the next Apple. And lastly, vote. Polls open up in 89 days, 15 hours, and 12 minutes. Make your voice heard. It will make a difference. So on that note, uh, I really am looking forward to hearing all your projects and wish you all the very best. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you, Jose. Thank you so much. Um, now we turn our focus to our green teams. 
Our green teams have been working hard this summer under exceptional conditions, as Kyle mentioned, and they've been led by an amazing group of individuals. Tirza Mills, our program coordinator, Yvette Viasus and Danielle Dalpesky, our assistant project managers who are all amazing, and our exceptional project manager, Amelia Miller, who has been with us for three years now. We are grateful for the guidance that all of these former green team members have provided our green teams, as well as the support provided by our resource specialists, Athena Serafides, Chris Snyder, Ralph Alasio, and Emma Lavin. And now you will hear from three of our green teams about the projects they completed this summer. You can add your questions in the Q&A, and we'll have a joint Q&A session for about, three, uh, for about 10 minutes after the first three teams. And then we'll hear from more, some more speakers and more teams um, a little bit later. So now we'd like to have our first team, our PSEG green team, share their project with you. Hi everyone, we are the PSEG Institute for Sustainability Studies green team serving PSEG. We'd like to begin our project by briefly introducing all of our team members, starting with myself. My name is Lauren Hope and I am a sustainability science major from Montclair State University. Good morning, my name is Sean McKay. I'm an energy business and finance major at Penn State University. Hi, my name is Gabrielle Mills and I study English professional writing and journalism at Montclair State University. Good morning, my name is Chikwendo Mwachiko. I study electrical engineering from New Jersey Institute of Technology. Hi everyone, my name is Maya Shah. I attend Yale University studying applied mathematics and psychology. Now we'd like to talk a little bit about PSCG, who we worked alongside with this summer. PSCG stands for Public Service Enterprise Group. Their CEO is Ralph Izzo, who manages company operations, including electric and gas generation, distribution, and transmission. PSCG, PSCG is a Fortune 500 company, and their subsidiary, PSCNG, is New Jersey's largest electric and gas provider and one of the largest combined electric and gas companies in the U.S. They have 13,000 employees across New Jersey and Long Island, and at 117 years old, they are very well established. And PSCNG is New Jersey's oldest publicly owned utility company. Throughout these last 10 weeks, we were tasked with these four deliverables that you see on the screen here. And so I'll start going into what these were and what their importance were. So for our first deliverable with energy consumption, we were given data um, from 2008 to 2019 for the energy usage at 80 Park Plaza, which is PSCG headquarters in Newark, New Jersey. We reorganized this data so that it was easier to analyze and notice trends in the data. And this way PSCG would be able to monitor changes in the future based on these summaries. For waste reduction, we identified what materials PSCG was sending to landfills the most based on the number of tons sent. And without reducing this number in, uh, of waste in landfills, things like sending lots of wood to landfills aids in deforestation, which could also lead to displacement of wildlife, contamination would negatively impact water for communities and much more. So reducing this amount of waste is very important, but also by reducing this waste has positive effects like reducing greenhouse gas emissions, local pollution, groundwater contamination, while also improving resource conservation. Our next deliverable, employee engagement. Our goal was to encourage employees to engage in more sustainable practices and educate themselves more about making their daily activities more environmentally friendly. So reducing environmental impacts from within the company um, was kind of the focus of this rather than waiting for what has already been produced. For our scope three emissions deliverable, similarly to the energy consumption deliverable that I was speaking about before, calculating scope emissions is excuse me, established a baseline for PSCG to recognize what categories needed to be focused on for emission reduction in the future. So overall, the purpose of all of these deliverables was to reduce the environmental impact that PSCG creates with their day-to-day -day works. And now I'll go into how we completed these deliverables. For our energy consumption deliverable, we reorganized the data specifically from 2008 and 2013 of the 80 Park Plaza that I was speaking about before so that it was much easier to interpret. And we created summaries of the grand totals in charts and bar graphs using Excel for an overview of the data since 2008. 
And for both waste reduction and employee engagement, it was more focused on research and the creativity of the team. So we researched PSEG's top competitors methods of waste disposal and employee engagement in order to brainstorm more creative methods to implement within PSEG, which my colleague will talk about in a future slide. For scope three emissions, we calculated these using given equations and emission factors on the same version of Excel that the energy consumption deliverable was completed on. After completing our deliverables, we compiled our results and I'll begin discussing the energy consumption results. So this is one of the graphs that we thought was good to share because it showed a very clear downward trend. Um, we also had 10 other bar graphs displaying the grand totals, but this one obviously shows a much clearer trend. So in this graph, kilowatt hour use, which is the amount of electrical energy used in the 80 Park Plaza facility, and kilowatt use decreased by over 50% from 2008 to 2019, which shows a great improvement in energy efficiency. We believe it would be ideal for PSCNG to initiate a company-wide waste reduction plan. This plan should be personalized to each facility, reward individuals for milestone goals, and contain an overall goal to encourage reduction in waste production and long-term lifestyle changes. To help formulate this plan, we've created a waste report outlining top 10 waste materials sent to landfills, PSE and G operations. This report names and quantifies waste material, describes waste material, describes the damage of the material in landfill, and also introduces benefits of reasonable recycling or repurposing process rather than landfill disposal. The University of Arizona Water Resource Research Center states that 60 to 65% of wastewater has the potential to be reused. Of the 16,400 tons of wastewater disposed in PSCNG operations, 10,600 tons of that wastewater can be treated and reused. This pie chart shows every material from PSCNG operations that are disposed of in landfills. And as you can see, contaminated soil and wastewater are the largest contributors to landfills. Our, result, our results for employee engagement are described in a report explaining the importance of sustainability and viable sustainable practices for employees. We provide volunteer opportunities and branch locations for PSCG employees to engage in their community and also possible sustainable certification programs to become more involved in the company's sustainable initiatives. We've also formulated a Green Olympics, which is a branch specific competition measuring participation in sustainable practices and waste reduction. This Green Olympics, uh, the facilities will receive points for employees participating in sustainable actions, such as categorizing trash to reduce the amount sent to landfills or equipment of reusable items. And each and the facility with the most points will win rewards. Our Green Leaders Program allows managers and employees to take the lead in implementing sustainable initiatives into their specific facilities. Next, we looked into greenhouse gases because of their impact to our environment, such as they've been fueling hurricanes and destroying the coral reefs. Looking into our reporting company, emissions from PSCNG could be grouped into three types. First are scope one emissions. These are direct emissions that result from power generation. Then scope two emissions, which are emissions um, from the fl vehicle fleet and line losses during transmission and distribution. Then finally, we focused on scope three, which are also indirect emissions, but they result outside the walls of PSCNG, which they are also responsible for. These emissions could be due to upstream activities or downstream activities. But most importantly, quantification of um, scope three emissions are not mandatory, unlike quantification of scope one and scope two emissions, which are mandatory for organization and disclosing of their greenhouse gas emissions. However, the, due to the importance of scope three emissions, the CDP came up with a construct known as the scope three to help companies fully understand the, the impact uh, of their um, emissions to the environment. So they come up with that construct because if we, if we from the results for that, we'll see that the total corporate um, emissions come from scope three, which means that companies have been missing out of a significant opportunities for improvement. And this area, most companies have ignored also in the past because it occurs outside the company. So next we'll look into the uh, results of our project. 
so for the for the results, we prepared a spreadsheet, a detailed spreadsheet that um, shows every ca relevant category. In total, there are 15 categories for scope three emissions, but for our, for our reports, only four of them were important, which are purchase goods and services, capital goods, and purchase of fuel, then finally the use of sold products. So the pie chart will actually explain. Okay. No, net, yeah, that one. So for our spreadsheet, we, we, we use the spend based method for our calculation. And it's actually pretty much an easy calculation. What we did, we use the dollar amount of each item, then they have an emission factor. We multiply the item by the emission factor. And for to be clear, the, the numbers used here are just sample values. This does not represent the original numbers we use for our project and for our calculation. So what we did, we multiply the emission factor by the dollar amount. Then at the end, we totaled every num. Um, we thought we got the sum, which gave us the total of um, the total kilogram CO2 equivalent, which is the emission into the environment. So next, we'll look into our pie chart. So to put everything in perspective, we came up with a pie chart to show the greatest contributors to the scope three emissions. So from here, we see that the purchase goods and services, we combined it with the capital goods and that made up 1%. Next, we looked into the purchase of fuel, we made up just 11%. Then finally, the greatest contributor, the use of sold goods. And uh, I will explain further, the use of sold goods is um, all used goods and services sold by the reporting company, in this case, which is PSCNG. And for this case, is the natural gas PSC and G purchased and sold to its customers. So from looking into all the calculations, this puts PSG in a better place to be able to understand the corporate value chain and so they can focus on significant emission reduction opportunities as shown. Thank you. Now you're probably thinking all of this information is great, but how do we implement it? Moving forward, we recommend the following strategies for each of these categories. For energy consumption, we recommend reorganizing data into user-friendly sheets. This aids in the analysis process. For waste reduction, we recommend impl implementation of the strategies created in our waste reduction report, including alternative disposal methods for materials such as contaminated soil, PVC pipe, and trash. For employee engagement, we recommend implementation of the findings of our employee engagement report. Things such as the employee volunteer initiatives, continuing of employee education, and the Green Olympics initiative. For scope three, we recommend investing more time into reducing scope three emissions using our emissions calculations as a guide. This will help to reduce the greenhouse gases that PSCG emits. And finally, for our acknowledgements, we would like to thank the following groups and individuals listed here for their continued support throughout our project. And lastly, we would like to thank the funders shown here. Thank you for your time. Thanks very much to Team PSEG. And now we'll move on to our next team, Team City of Newark, who's gonna share with you their project. And please remember, as we're moving through this, put any questions you may have for these three teams in the Q&A. Good morning. We are the PSEG Institute for Sustainability Studies Green Team serving the City of Newark for the summer of 2020. Good morning, everyone. I want to start by introducing the team 20, of 2020, starting with myself, Iman Cumberbatch. I'm an information technology major at Montclair State University. Hi, my name is Abby Holden, and I'm an environmental studies major at Bates College. My name is Olivia Johnston, and I'm a mathematics major at Morgan State University. My name is Vincent Adoro. I'm an environmental science major at William Patterson University, as well as a Marine Corps veteran, where I served four years after duty. Hi, I'm Ismael Nunez, and I'm a civil engineering major at the College of New Jersey. To give a little background about the city of New York, it is, a pop is the most populous city in New Jersey. It has roughly a population of about 282,011 from 2019's estimate. 
and it's home to a majority of Latinx, immigrants, and Black people. It also is a crossroads city, which means it has a lot of commercial trade coming in and out of the city through multiple forms of transportation, such as airport, seaport, highway corridors, and even rail. So this summer, we've been working with Newark's Office of Sustainability, specifically Natalie Agosto Filion, who's their Chief Sustainability Officer, and Jonathan Gordon, who's their Climate Action Coordinator. Um, a little bit of background about the office. They developed their first Sustainability Action Plan in 2013 and another one in 2018, and they're currently working on a third installment. And these plans are just laid out different steps that they can take to reduce their carbon footprint and overall just make the city cleaner, greener, healthier, more prepared for the future and more engaged with their Newark residents. This summer, we were able to help the city of Newark take a step towards climate mitigation by creating their very first greenhouse gas inventory. From there, the city can set goals and plans to reduce their carbon emissions, which will improve the air quality and overall quality of life for its residents. By starting with a municipal inventory, the city wanted to start by doing that to create a sense of transparency between the city and the community. Overall, this would make Newark a healthier and cleaner city for its residents. So in order to ensure we help make Newark a better city, we had to focus on climate action by developing data sets to inform proposed actions. Second, we had to make a greenhouse gas inventory using ICWIS ClearPath software. And in order to be able to develop the greenhouse gas inventory, we had to go through a lot of data that needed vetting to ensure accuracy of available data and to find the missing data. So for a little bit more background, ICLEI is a global network of over 1,700 local and regional governments in over 100 countries. As you can see in the top right, there is Copenhagen, Denmark, and in the bottom right, Kyoto, Japan, and in the bottom left, Los Angeles County in the USA. They're all members of ICLEI. What ICLEI does is make it easier for these governments to create and implement sustainability goals. One of the ways it does that is through their ClearPath software. It helps governments take the first step by creating a greenhouse gas inventory. It also has tools and calculators to find out emissions on the government operations level and community-wide. The software also includes planning and forecasting tools to help governments reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. The first step in achieving our deliverables was first to organize the data and then also to organize it in a way that was comprehensive for us and made it easier for us to draw conclusions. Uh, so what this was, this meant was to compile a list of unique municipal account numbers. Um, we received a number like maybe 12 spreadsheets with account numbers, uh, consumption data, uh, departments, addresses, uh, different kinds of uh, data. Uh, but we had to make it um, comprehensive and, and, and make it into a summarized uh, spreadsheet. So um, Google Sheets and Excel helped us automate the process of linking addresses and, facil and facility types, as well as consumption. Um, and ultimately, the data was helpful because um, through the addresses, we were able to create a map and a dashboard, and we were also able to create a greenhouse gas inventory with the consumption data. So once we were able to organize the data, we were able to find any missing data areas. What we found was that in 2019, 21% of electric consumption was not linked to a specific department or sector of city operations, which is especially important when putting the consumption data into ClearPath. Also in 2019, 15% of gas consumption was not linked to a sector of city operations. So once we had all of our data organized and compiled, we were able to begin inputting it into the ClearPath software. And the images on the screen show what this looks like. So on the left, you can see there are different tabs on the top for the different sectors within the city. And there are calculators associated with each one. Um, as you can see, there's grid electricity, stationary fuel combustion from natural gas and others. And on the right is a picture of what these calculators look like. Um, so this one, for instance, is public buildings electric consumption. Um, and you can see there are places where you can input different data. Um, and so we input the total electricity used for each year. And then ClearPath would output the greenhouse gas emissions from that consumption use. Using the address link, we were able to create a map and dashboard, as mentioned earlier, using ArcGIS Pro, which is a software used for mapping, and also ArcGIS Online that we use for dashboard. So in order for these maps to be shown, through the data, we went to a data, a data process um, using geocoding. So the geocoding tool in ArcGIS Pro 
allows you just to identify any address and pair to a specific coordinate on the map. So since a lot of the addresses given weren't correct when it came to the spelling or the abbreviation, one thing we've been doing is just manually rematching the addresses. So the rematching process overall when geocoding allows the system to track the, the um, sorry, to track the system accurately and for the best results. Before we moved on to create the greenhouse gas inventory, we first had to make a few assumptions um, and address some of the missing data. So as you can see in the tables below, a, a lot of the account numbers didn't have a department or a facility type attached to them. You'll see in 2019 for electric and gas consumption, 21% uh, of the account numbers did not have a facility type attached to them. And then for gas, it was 15%. So what we did was we looked at a table like the one you're seeing on the screen and we looked at public buildings and we noticed that there's a steep drop off between 2018 and 2019 percent of the total that it shared um, you'll see that for electric it, it went from 42 percent to 16 percent and then for gas it went from 95 to 80 percent so just based on these numbers uh, we thought it would be most appropriate to attribute the missing account numbers towards uh, public buildings and then uh, once we made that assumption we finally had the final consumption data that we were able to use for the greenhouse gas inventory So getting into a bit of our results, these two tables show the annual consumption for each facility type from 2017 to 2019. Um, the table on the top is electric consumption and the one on the bottom is gas consumption. Um, and something you might notice if you look at these sum totals, um, there's a spike in uh, consumption in 2018 for both electric and gas and then a subsequent reduction. Um, we believe this is just due to different weather patterns um, but through the years and um, increased uses of air conditioning or heating systems throughout the city that would increase consumption use. And something surprising that we noticed um, is that streetlights and traffic signals, um, specifically unmetered, which just means that they don't know exactly how much consumption they're using, it's just an estimate. Um, we noticed that the streetlights and traffic signals had the most electric consumption for all three years. Um, and this is something that we were not expecting to find and was very interesting. So here we have a graph uh, by annual CO2E or CO2 equivalent by facility type. So what CO2E means is this the number of metric tons of CO2 emissions with the same global warming potential as a one metric ton of another greenhouse gas. So here in 2017 to 2018, we could see a increase by 6.7% of emissions of CO2E. And from 2018 to 2019, we see a drop off of 14% of CO2 emissions. Each year, each sector was pretty consistent throughout the years. Here is a dashboard just to show the departments and facilities that contribute to greenhouse gas emissions throughout mainly of North. So the city will be able to click on any location on the map and it'll just give them pop-up information about how much that specific location has consumed annually and its addresses and what department it's in. This is all in hopes to provide them with the most effective way to reduce the city's greenhouse gas emissions with clear visuals and hold departments accountable. Our emissions data allowed us to create a forecast for different scenarios that Newark can take to reduce their emissions. Um, so the black dotted line on the graph just shows the 2019 emissions and where they were. Um, and the red line shows a business as usual scenario. And this just means that Newark would not implement any reduction strategies and would just continue to admit um, as they are now. And you can see that by 2050, there would be an increase in emissions if they did that. Um, and then we wanted to look at two different strategies that they can use to reduce. So the blue line shows an 80% reduction um, of 2006 emission levels by the year 2050. And this is New Jersey's statewide commitment to adhere to the Paris Agreement. And then we also wanted to include a bit of a more ambitious scenario in which the city is actually able to become net zero by 2050. And this is represented by the green line in the graph. To make it easier for future data collection, we also created a few templates. As you can see on the left, there's an employee commute survey to account for more indirect causes for greenhouse gas emissions from city operations. On the right, we have a template for gas and electric consumption. Um, it's a 
It's organized by account number, and then we also have the facility type, and we did it by monthly so that it's easier to track and create a greenhouse gas inventory in the future. Uh, one of the areas uh, that we thought had the most potential for improvement when it comes to efficiency is uh, traffic signals. So uh, currently, uh, the city of Newark, we we analyzed and we made it. We concluded that uh, the city of Newark emits about 1,500 metric uh, sorry yeah metric tons of CO2 uh, just from the traffic signals. And uh, one of the reasons why is because um, they still have about 46% of, of their traffic signals using incandescent traffic signal bulbs, which is the con uh, conventional way. However, many cities have been switching to LEDs because they are about 10 times more efficient than incandescent uh, signal bulbs. Um, so we wanted to look at how many, what improvements we can get from switching over from incandescent to LEDs. Um, we, we, our analysis shows that about, they have about 4,800 traffic signals. If they were to convert entirely to LEDs, they can see an improvement of about 77% um, in emissions, in emissions reductions. And right now, 88% of their emissions come from um, incandescent bulbs, even though they only make up 46% of the traffic signals they have. So some recommendations we have for the city of Newark, like Ismail had just said, was the implication of LED traffic lights to cut down their emissions. Also the electrification of their vehicle fleet, which Newark already has a plan for. Um, turning their electrical fleet, uh, their fleet into electric vehicles or at least more sustainable or greener fuels will definitely cut down on their CO2 emissions. Anything where from compressed gas to biodiesel, anything um, like that. And also more efficient building systems. So sustainability, sustainable buildings, uh, greener buildings, also using their electricity in a more efficient way from solar panels or just using systems of heating and cooling that are just way, way more efficient on the energy usage. Finally, we'd like to thank and acknowledge the people that have been providing support to us this summer. And finally, we'd like to thank our funders. Fantastic team city of Newark. Thank you so much. Um, that was that was great. Good information to have. And we now, um, so we've heard from corporations about emissions. We've heard about community emissions. And now we're gonna move to city of Jersey City and see the other side of this. So previously we've helped um, city of Jersey City quantify their emissions in the city of Jersey City. And um, they're currently using that information to inform their climate action plan process, which is in place right now. And the project that you're about to hear about is the other side of this, and that's the carbon sequestration. So you'll hear about mapping of street trees in the city and carbon sequestration in, in those street trees. Team, Team City of Jersey City, take it away. Hi, we are the PSEG Institute for Sustainability Studies Green Team serving Jersey City. I'm Saul Contreras, a physics major from Montclair State University. I'm Jitsia Guzman, a geography informational systems and sustainability major at Rowan University. I'm Miranda Muniz, and I'm sustainability science major from Montclair State University. I'm Javonica Lattimore, an environmental engineer major at Keene University. And my name is David Lisboa. I'm a biology major from Fairleigh Dickinson University. So this is just some background information on Jersey City. Jersey City is located in Hudson County, New Jersey. It has a population of 265,549 citizens since the 2018 Census Bureau. There are six words outlining Jersey City. In the summer of 2019, uh, Jersey City did a collaboration uh, with New NJCU on tree mapping within Wards A. Jersey City this summer of 2020 was asked us to make progress in accurately mapping and analyzing the, the city's trees, which was continuing the work done in 2019 of mapping Ward A into Wards B and Ward F. We were asked to estimate 
carbon sequestration, which is the carbon intake of each tree within Jersey City using an infrared gas analyzer, and make recommendations on communicating tree-related information to the public, as well as develop a report and presentation that offers a plan on improving the city's trees. There are many benefits of having street trees in urban areas. Street trees in urban areas provide shade, which can cool the temperature of the area. They also increase the air quality and produce oxygen while absorbing rainwater, which can lead to lower levels of flooding, which is really important during times of intense storms. There's a lot of also benefits to tree mapping that goes beyond just having the GPS points of the trees in the city. It gives a forester an index of all the tree species in Jersey City, and in that we can see which tree species are capturing the most carbon. It also gives the forester the conditions of the trees in Jersey City and gives them a map of where the dead and unhealthy trees are in the city that can be removed. And it also gives them a map of where all of the empty pits are in the city, where there were trees, but now there is an empty location. So when the forester is looking to increase the tree canopy quickly, they have a map of all of the empty spaces in the city where trees can be added. These were some of the tools we used to collect our data. We used an ergo portable photosynthesis that was able to measure our carbon sequestration from each tree. We used a Leica Xeno 20 that allowed us to take down the points of, on the GPS to say this is where this tree is. We used Survey123 mobile app to collect the information of each tree, specifically the species, the diameter at breast height, and pit length and width. We also used ArcGIS Pro to create an interactive map for the forester of Jersey City as well as the public. Ensuring accuracy was a really important component of our project. Since we were working with GPS points, um, it was we were getting that information from satellites, but satellites don't stay still throughout the day. They move and that changes the accuracy of the points. So we found that at certain times of the day, we were actually able to gather more correct data, more accurate data, depending on where the satellites were at that point in time. So one reason that it's really important to have that precise GPS data is if we're collecting all of these attributes of the trees to give to the forester and give to the city, but they can't find the tree that we're talking about, then it pretty much makes our information useless. So it was really important to us. We also tried to be accurate when labeling the condition of the tree if it was dead or unhealthy. So the forester would know which trees to focus on first. And then accuracy really just saved time by giving the city and the public information that they can trust. And one of the tools that we used in our data collection to ensure this was the Leica Xeno 20. The Leica Xeno 20 we found has an average of really high accuracy by also giving us X and Y coordinates instead of something a bit more vague like a street address. And it gave us a figure ID for easy identification. And we use this in collaboration with a MiFi, which is portable Wi-Fi to also help us with our field work. And this map shows the progress we have made this summer in mapping towards B and F. Each point is color coded to indicate the condition of the tree. The black squares are pits, red are dead trees, yellow are trees we found to be visibly unhealthy, such as having trees with no leaves or having damaged bark, and green are the healthy trees. We also looked at different characteristics, such as the diameter at breast height, the pit length and width, the scientific name, and we included a photo showing physical damage of the tree. And this is a pie chart showing the tree conditions in wards B and F. Although it was shown that the majority of trees were unhealthy, we saw that about 20% of trees were uh, just empty pits where new trees can be added. 2% were dead trees, so these need to be removed and hopefully replaced. And then 22% of trees were unhealthy, so these just need to be kept a closer eye on so that they don't end up being dead trees. 
If you look at the graph on the top left, we compared the health of the tree among the species. And we did this by conducting an analysis on variance followed by a Tukey post hoc mean separation. And from this, we can see that on the left, the London plain and all of the trees up to the Bradford pear are relatively healthy in our data sample. And the last four trees on the right there, the Bradford pear, the white ash, the honey locust, and the Japanese pagoda were relatively unhealthy within our data set. Now, if you see on the graph on the bottom right, you can see that there were more healthy trees in Ward B and more unhealthy trees in Ward F. And that was because we think Ward F is a more industrial area while Ward B is more residential and may have better conditions for tree growth. So another thing that we collected when collecting data for the trees was the DVH or the diameter at breast height. Um, we found that actually a lot more trees were younger trees. That's why you see that big bar for the 15 to 30 uh, centimeter um, size. Um, these DBH is actually really helpful in collecting and adding to the carbon sequestration data. It helps us get the surface area of the leaf. And it also helps us find and figure out how much carbon the tree is sequestering. We wanted to see if there was a relationship between the condition of the tree and the pit area. We initially hypothesized that the smaller the pit area, the worse the tree condition would be. But statistics showed that there was no clear correlation between the pit area and the tree condition. We in, fa we in fact found that the healthy trees were able to be found in pits of very uh, various sizes. We also found that there were many unhealthy trees within the smaller pits. Here we have a plot with a plentiful uh, bunch of information. On the left-hand y-axis, we have the tree count. On the x-axis, we have the species. And on the right-hand y-axis, we have the net carbon flux. The thicker bars represent the tree count. So as you can see, the London Plain is the tree that we encountered the most. The, a close second was the Bradford pear, Bradford pear, which we also encountered quite a bit. And the thinner bars represent the net carbon flux. The tree that we, we encountered that had the highest net carbon flux was the green ash. A close second was the uh, little leaf linden. The yellow bars are the trees that we would recommend uh, based off of the, their, their average healths. And the brown bars we wouldn't recommend. We were able to estimate that there are uh, 23,346 trees in Jersey City, and the amount of carbon that they sequester can be conceptualized in terms of 3.5 million pounds of coal burned, seven, about 7.9 miles, million miles driven by an average passenger vehicle, or about 404 million uh, smartphones charged. So just think about that amount of energy that is sequestered by the trees. It just shows how much, how, how valuable the, the, tr the city's green infrastructure is with respect to helping against carbon, helping take up carbon because we know that there's 417 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air and we have to act on that. Uh, we also see that if all of the pits were filled, if all of the pits on healthy trees and, um, and dead trees were replaced by healthy trees, we would see a 57% increase in sequestration, which just shows that there is plenty of potential for increase in sequestration. One of our deliverables as stated before was reaching the public and making Jersey City's website more attainable and more user-friendly. So in, in, in those efforts, we created some infographics um, that'll help the public get a better understanding of exactly what um, a tree canopy is and how helpful the trees in front of their houses actually are. So on the left, you see the healing and beautifying a tree spit um, infographic. And we just have um, one and two as just like healthy, like maintenance kind of um, ways that they can just can maintain their pit by like watering and adding a, a, a mulch. Um, number three is also maintenance as in like picking weeds, just keeping the pit as clean as possible. Um, number four is for more like a look like um, 
to make a, have a prettier curb appeal. Um, so we had put add annual flowers, which is really good and is okay for the pit and it's safe. Number five is just like a, a, a big don't that we really wanted to emphasize, which was avoid filling the empty pits. And number six is actually to do some more research if they don't understand. Um, they can uh, scan that QR code using their cell phone and it'll actually take them to the dock on the right, the how to care for your pit and the adding to your pit. Um, so how to care for your pit just talks about the proper mulching techniques. Um, the information was taken from the New Jersey Tree Foundation. Um, and it's just little quotes from there. And it also gives um, them some mulch options that are really good. We found that organic mulch actually does better than inorganic mulch. Um, and then adding to your pit just talks about the possible flowers that they can add to their pit that are all annuals and um, the certain seasons that they can um, plant them in. And then at the bottom, there's also another link to take them to garden.org, which is a whole catalog of more annuals that they can possibly plant. The last one is the one in the middle, the Arbor Day celebration is just something that we've talked about, possibly having the city get a little bit closer with the residents by just creating a little like party kind of celebration thing on Arbor Day where they talk about trees and there's sustainable vendors, there's music, there's food, families can come, it's free of entry, just to get people a little bit more involved in understanding tree canopy and the health and tree health. and in making our data more available and transparent to the public, we created this Jersey City Tree Canopy Dashboard, which will be incorporated into the Jersey City website. So all the charts and graphs are completely interactive. And we also included this video, which explains what a tree canopy is, as well as why it's beneficial to the city. And when you select a point on the map, you get a pop-up, which tells you all the attributes we mentioned earlier, as well as a photo of the tree. We'd like to just give a huge thank you for the people that allowed us to do this project and the people that also helped us along with in this project. I'm um, starting with Ms. Kate Lawrence, Carolina Ramos, Edward O'Malley, Dr. William Montgomery, Lindsay Sigmund, the City of Jersey City's Division of Architecture, Dr. Dirk Vanderklein, Dr. Josh Galster, Yvette Viasus, Amelia Miller, and Dr. Amy Tuninga. We would also like to thank our funders for making this project possible. Fantastic Team City of Newark. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so now we're gonna segue into a brief 10 minute Q&A session. And um, I think we're gonna start with a question for the um, City of Newark team. So Team City of Newark, um, what challenges have you had to overcome in using the greenhouse gas accountability software? And we'll need a volunteer from the Team City of Newark to speak up on that. Yeah, so we actually found the ClearPath software, which is the um, software that makes the inventory pretty straightforward. And we didn't have many issues with it. The most issues that we had and challenges we had to overcome was organizing the data to then be put into the software. Um, so we were given maybe about 12 Excel sheets with account numbers, addresses, consumption data, and all spread across 12 different Excel sheets. And we had to find a way to somehow link them all together and get it organized onto one easy sheet that was easy to read and easy to input. Um, and so that ended up being, I think, the most challenging and time consuming part of our whole project. Thank you. Um, and so let's stay on uh, the team City of Newark for just a moment with another question. Um, so the audience is asking about the initiatives that you're recommending in order to um, account for or reduce the emissions. And um, will the city actually be taking on the LED uh, bulb replacement? Do you know anything about that and what the cost savings might be? Do you have additional information that you might be able to share? Um, so I, I, I don't know, I know that they're, they are in the process of replacing uh, quite a few of their lights. Um, they've installed quite a few new lights too uh, this summer. Um, uh, but, but it's very doable. A lot of municipalities have gone 100% LEDs. I think uh, most cities in the Northeast are either 80% LEDs or, or higher. Um, Newark is a, is, is a bit of an older city, so uh, it's understandable that, that they don't have 
you know, all of their intersections with LED lights, but um, they're definitely going, they do own their traffic lights. So um, it's certainly something that's dual for them and a, a recommendation that they're taking to heart. Great, thank you. Um, so now we'll go to Team Jersey City. Uh, Team Jersey City, could you please just reiterate what it was that you used as criteria for unhealthy and healthy trees? We, when we considered unhealthy trees to be trees which had uh, fungus on, fungi on the roots or gashes in the bark or signs of spots on the leaves which, or signs of mildew because that's a sign of, any signs of infection or any, anything like that. Or if the tree canopy was, if one third of it was missing. And we considered dead trees to be the trees which had most of the canopy missing, more than half, or if there were no leaves on them. And, and the healthy trees were, um, had neither criteria. Great, thank you. Um, so could um, PSEG team, could you please share with us, is there anything additional that you can share about um, either plans to reduce plastics or um, to engage employees, um, any other details um, for, the, for your project, team PSEG? a little bit in depth about our um, waste reduction initiative. So it's a program, as Sean said before, that we're planning to initiate in um, each of the different facilities of PSCG. And essentially what it is gonna be is the um, managers of the facilities are going to tell um, their employees within that building how much waste they're hoping to reduce for that specific month. And if they're able to reduce the, those numbers by let's say bringing in their own food to work or reducing the amount of plastic bottles that they use, just being conscious of the amount of waste that they're producing as individuals, then by the end of if they reach their goal, then the facility manager will reward them with different things depending on whatever um, the facility manager chooses to do. And I think Lauren could speak a little bit more about the food waste reduction. Um, that we're planning to implement as well. Yeah, so in some of the larger facilities within PSCG, we want to um, combat food waste a little bit by um, having these individualized bins labeled specifically for food waste that can be composted. And PSCG has two options, whether they choose to compost it on their own, or we've also researched and supplied them with a couple companies who will, they are very local. They'll come pick up the um, food waste and they'll compost it. Uh, we're also going to be having um, just a bunch of educational posters that speak more about food waste and how individuals can reduce their food waste. Um, so that was just something we were looking into for the larger facilities. And will this information be shared among facilities? Is it going to be a competition or is it individual facilities that work on their own? Do you know? So the plan is very broad and it can happen both ways. It can happen um, within one facility or it can be competitive. So ultimately that will be up to the facility managers and how they would like to go about it. But the plan will work uh, both ways. We are hoping it can be a little bit competitive because competition really does spark creativity and passion. And I think it would go a little bit further. So we are hoping for a bit of a competitive element with our plan. Great. And I don't know whether this question would be best for you, Lauren, or somebody else on your team team, um, but um, the question is about finding solutions to reduce plastic waste and um, wrappers, gloves, masks, etc. from going into the waste stream. So can you address um, just generally, it may not be specifically something that you're recommending to PSEG, but generally um, recommendations for how best to reduce plastic waste? Is there anybody on your team that would like to take that question? Um, as far as plastic waste, um, we've seen like institutions such as like Montclair State University moving toward uh, like getting rid of plastic straws and things of that nature. And I do realize, we do realize that it's going to be a little harder because of a uh, pandemic. We want everything to be sanitary. Um, so perhaps it might not come with uh, preventative measures, but instead just making sure that that plastic is recycled and doesn't get into landfills because you want both to be sanitary and to be eco-friendly. I think this question is probably, thank you very much for your answer. I think this question is probably for me. Um, has the collaboration of green teams with different cities helped develop or identify tools or models that could be shared with or applied to other New Jersey towns and cities? Um, yes, in fact, our Jersey City um, project from two years ago 
um, was published um, as an admissions um, publication. And so that's open to the public. It's on the internet. And um, many of our items are on our, our website as resource materials. And you'll find out more about other municipalities and recommendations and outputs from our green teams program um, projects um, this uh, in the second half of today because we have students talking about a lot more municipalities. And the other question that I'll answer is about how to um, encourage students to apply and, and the applications will be open. I'll mention this again later, but the applications will be open on our um, website later. But I think um, Maybe we should toss it to you and and um, let you answer what you would say to another um, one of your colleagues who might be interested in applying and what you would say to them um, about your experience. So Gabby, do you want to start? The first thing that came to my mind is just to do it. <laughs> um, even if you feel that it might not be a good fit or that you're not fully qualified, um, there's a lot of on the job training and on the job learning. I myself am an English major with a minor in communications. So I came into this not knowing how I could be of use to my team, but there's a lot of writing and, and it worked out. So if you feel that perhaps, you know, you're underqualified, definitely look into what the teams have done in the past and kind of see yourself in that team and what your responsibility would be but I highly suggest applying. It's an amazing program with a bunch of amazing people. So do it. <laughs> Thank you. That's a pretty strong endorsement. Thank you. Um, so I think now we're gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to Amelia Miller. Um, who's going to share a little bit of information with us. So thank you for those questions. And we hope that people will continue sharing questions and we can answer them at another point in time. Thank you all for answering the questions. Amelia, over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Like you said, my name is Amelia. Um, now we have a very special message from US Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill, who proudly represents New Jersey's 11th Congressional District. After graduating from the United States Naval Academy in 1994, Representative Sherrill spent almost 10 years on active duty in the United States Navy. Congresswoman Sherrill holds a bachelor's degree from the United States Naval Academy, a master's degree in global history from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and a law degree from Georgetown University. Here's her special message for our 2020 Green Team students. Hi everyone, this is Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill. I'd like to congratulate you on completing your studies at MSU's Institute for Sustainability Studies. In your internships, you've tackled some of the most pressing questions we face as a society right now. Food security, sustainability, waste, and environmental challenges. You've seen the challenges and potential of sustainability, teleworking, transportation, and the list goes on. Challenges that our business community faces as a result of the pandemic and that we need to address as we work to reopen our economy and keep workers safe. All of you have had to demonstrate your perseverance and flexibility during a difficult time, and I'm inspired by your commitment to continuing to ask big questions and work towards solutions. You all give me great hope for our country's future. You have a lot to be proud of, and I know I speak for everyone in the community when I say we're so proud of you in return. Congratulations on this huge achievement, and best of luck in all of your future endeavors. So that was a, a very exciting thing, thing for us, and we really appreciate uh, Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill doing that. Now for one of our uh, big announcements today, we are very excited to share a special surprise with our students. They do not yet know about this. It is from Representative Sherrill. She sent each of our 2020 Green Teams members a United States Congressional Certificate recognizing their efforts this summer. Each member will receive their certificate shortly. This is an incredible honor, and we are so proud to have our students recognized by Cong Congresswoman Sherrill. Congratulations to all. And now we will take a short break. Please return in about 10 minutes. So let's say uh, 1055 and feel free to step away from your computer and stay connected because your video and audio are off due to Zoom webinar settings. And after this break, we're gonna hear about new technology for urban agriculture that is those raspberry pies, not the ones you eat, but still pretty cool, community energy efficiency and a closed loop food system to address food waste and recovery. So please join us back in about 15, 10 to 15 minutes at 10.55.
everybody, welcome back from our short break. Um, I'm just going to give, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple more seconds for uh, people to get back to the computer and and join us. And um, we have a very exciting guest speaker coming up. But before we get to that, I want to give a thank you to um, Dr. Amy Tuninga, our director, real quickly. So uh, she doesn't like the the spotlight on her too much, but I thought I'd I'd give her a little bit. I was an intern in 2018 and. What she has put together in this program is unlike anything else I've seen, we get to practice professional communication, we get to work in a team, we get to work with people outside of our majors, and we get to work on projects that are actually real world projects. And um, that in itself is amazing. And then on top of that, we're living in an extraordinary time right now where I think many people kind of assume that, um, you know, it's not gonna happen because of everything that's happening, it came in person, I guess the internship, can't happen. And I think um, Amy went to bat for us a lot and she's kind of said, you know what, we can make this work and we're, we're gonna do it. And we're all really incredibly thankful for her for doing that for us. And I'm so happy that these students this year got to experience this internship, even if it was slightly different than what I got. And then I think what really sets us apart, to be honest, is how much she cares about each of us and believes in us. So I feel every day that I'm appreciative for what I do and I, and I can see when she interacts with us, how much she cares for the interns and believes in them. And I think that's what really sets her apart and sets this program apart. She is everything you would want in a leader, a mentor, and a boss. So I just wanna say a big thank you to her. I know if we were in person, there'd be a big round of applause and I'm assuming you're all doing that or shaking your heads and nodding in agreement uh, because she really is that fantastic. But um, I know she doesn't like the light on her too much. And I do wanna get to this very exciting guest speaker. <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Bruce Stiftel. So uh, we're gonna continue with our speakers and our green team presentations. I want to introduce Dr. Bruce Stiftel. He currently serves as Professor Emeritus for the School of City and Regional Planning at Georgia Institute of Technology. His work involves collaborative governance of environmental policy and international movement of urban planning ideas. He served the United Nations UN Habitat as a member of expert groups on the Global Report on Human Settlements in 2009 International Guidelines on Urban and Territorial Planning, and the World Cities Report in 2016. Dr. Stiftel served as a founding chairperson for the Gov Global Planning Educational Association Network, for which he serves as the representative to the UN Habitat and its University Network Initiative. We're happy to hear from you now, Dr. Stiftel. Thank you, Amelia. It's a delight to be here this, uh, this morning. Um, uh, congratulations to all the green team participants. Uh, your, your work is inspirational. In, uh, in Atlanta, our, we have eight universities that are cooperating in a regional center of expertise on education for sustainable development, the so-called RCE. And our, uh, our goal is to promote uh, civic engagement uh, for sustainable development. Uh, and uh, the work that you're doing is really a model for us. It's wonderful to, to hear about it today. I, uh, I'd like to take just uh, some, a few minutes this morning uh, to talk about city development and city planning in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, I'm going to start by um, uh, looking at uh, uh, urbanization globally uh, uh, in just a quick snapshot. This is uh, a graphic from 1995 from a UN report that shows uh, city size and percent urbanization around the world. And you can uh, see the red dots that represent cities over 10 million. There are 13 of those, there were 13 of those cities of more than 10 million population in 1995. And if we advance uh, to the 2015 slide, uh, the uh, number of red dots has more than doubled. There are 27 cities in 2015 that have more than 10 million population. Tokyo is currently the largest uh, urban agglomeration, as we planners say, uh, in the world with 37 million people. And there are a total of nine uh, cities or urban agglomerations, if you will, that have more than um, 20 million today. Uh, so you can see that we have in the last generation been urbanizing quite rapidly. But let's look ahead at projections toward 2100. Uh, these numbers come from the University of Toronto. 
and they project that by 2100, there will be 10 cities of more than 50 million people, five zero million people. At the head of the list is Lagos, Nigeria with a projected 88 million people. And they show a total of over of 15 cities with more than 40 million. We clearly are not prepared for how we will deal with cities of that enormous size. We're, we're looking by the end of the, of, uh, we're, we're looking by the middle of the century at having an urban population that is two and a half billion people more than it is today. Um, we're, we're currently 55% of the world is urban and by mid-century, by 2050, the UN projections are that 68% of the world will be urban. Uh, that's two and a half billion more urban residents and we don't know how we're gonna do it. Uh, the largest part of the growth between now and mid-century is in Asia, but then in the latter part of the century, the projections of growth are gonna be uh, heavily in Africa. And, um, and, and those countries have such a long way to go to be prepared for how to cope with that growth. So with that context, I wanna talk a little bit about urban planning in the past. And uh, I'm gonna start with these two images. One is from Southern France of a Roman aqueduct built in the first century to move water 31 miles to a, a Roman outpost. Um, and uh, that makes the point to me that we have been planning cities for a very long time. Um, and on the right uh, is a graphic from the plan for Philadelphia done in 1682 by Captain Thomas Home. And uh, that plan for an early colonial city on our continent was very much informed by a fire which took place in London in 1666, less than 20 years earlier. And so the Philadelphia plan uh, called for brick construction. It did not allow wooden construction in the city. And it had what they thought of at the time as exceptionally wide streets, streets that were 50 feet wide. Um, uh, it, all streets were 50 feet and some of them were wider. Um, and it makes the point to me of how what we do in city building at any given point in time tends to respond to the, the challenges and even catastrophes that our cities have experienced uh, in the very recent past. And we, we continue to see that and certainly you're hearing lots of talk about in the wake of COVID-19, how is that gonna change the way we plan and develop cities? So I also wanna make the point that our city development, uh, uh, certainly on this continent, but it's true globally, uh, has responded to incentives and regulation and legislation um, and tax policies that are put in place by governments. So um, in, the, in the 19th century, the United States moved uh, with dispatch across the continent and it was our explicit policy uh, to occupy the lands in the West. And we passed a series of laws that gave land grants to people who would move West. We gave enormous amounts of property to the railroads to encourage them to build the railroad lines and make it possible for people to move West. Um, and that was the first generation of migration in our country. We've had three generations since. We moved from uh, an agricultural country in, uh, into the river towns and then from the river towns into an, our industrial cities as the industrial revolution moved forward. And then in the middle 20th century, we moved to the suburbs. And each of those movements um, was, res was responding to uh, benefited from, uh, followed the dictates of policies that we made at city, uh, state, and especially national levels. Um, this graphic uh, shows the uh, population increases in Chicago as the Industrial Revolution proceeded. So in a 90-year period from 1840 until 1930, the city of Chicago uh, moved from 4,000 in population to 3.4 million in population. Um, and that, uh, the, the draw of the industrial cities uh, was an enormous migration that very much changed the face of the United States um, uh, as it changed the face of Europe as well. Um, and that migration brought with it a number of extraordinary perils. Uh, the industrial cities 
were really not prepared for the kinds of population increases that they, uh, that they gained in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And we had uh, terrible air pollution. We had waterborne disease uh, in epidemic proportions in, at some periods. Uh, we had a housing stock uh, that it was not conducive to health and, uh, and, and really resulted in higher levels of disease than were necessary. And our country responded by passing laws to, to rein in and respond to and control these trends. So uh, we passed a number of tenement laws that spoke to the design of, of, uh, of homes uh, and the construction of homes. We, were, we required indoor plumbing. We required uh, a window in every room, which was not normal or was not universal before the middle 19th century. Um, we, uh, we built systems of, uh, of sewage, uh, which uh, in many of our cities did not exist uh, before the middle 19th century. Uh, so uh, we responded to the industrial revolution with a key set of, uh, of changes in the way we built our cities. And by the end of the 19th century, um, we had uh, in our profession of city planning, two themes of the way we wanted to build our cities that would respond to the challenges of the industrial revolution. So we talk about the city beautiful movement, which emphasized parks and boulevards and monuments and public buildings that were intended to uplift the spirit of the populace. The thought was that if there's beauty in the city, people's lives will be better. If there are parks, people will be able to recreate more easily and so on. And at the same period of time, we, we had what was called the city practical movement, the effort to take uh, principles of scientific management, which were uh, beginning to be used in industry and to transfer those to municipal management and think about how can we rationalize transportation, land use, sanitation, and housing? Um, how can we use science to make better decisions in government? Uh, as we moved into the, uh, the post-war years, post-World War I years in the United States, we, um, we had three key trends in the way we planned our cities, which I think are, are largely responsible for the way uh, the cities that we live in today are structured. So one of those was a trend toward comprehensiveness, that we didn't just want city plans that were urban design plans. We wanted city plans that took account for transportation, for housing, for jobs, um, uh, for conservation, and that looked at the full range of issues that uh, represented the nature of urban life. We also um, had a trend toward decentralization, um, especially with the development of the private passenger car. It became possible to imagine living uh, in less crowded conditions than those industrial cities of the late 19th century. And there were many proposals for uh, different kinds of designs. Uh, in New Jersey, the city of Radburn was looked to as, as an early pioneer um, in the tradition of the English garden cities uh, promoted by Ebenezer Howard. Uh, Radburn has super blocks. It separates the movement of pedestrians and bicycles from motor vehicles. Um, it, um, uh, it, it puts things within walking distance of, uh, of many, if not most, of the homes. Um, there's a, a wonderful quote uh, from uh, the 20s that, uh, in, Mich in Michigan Municipal Review about Radburn. It says, Radburn stands out singly, not because it is the biggest or the most beautiful of cities, but because it is the first tangible product of a new urban science that seeks to make the places of man's habitation and industry fit the health requirements of his daily life. Um, Radburn is kind of the ideal of what we, what planners and developers in the, in the post-World War I era thought the suburbs were going to be. Uh, you know what the suburbs have become. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, the third trend that was happening in the early 20th century was the trend toward regionalization. The, the idea that we needed to be concerned with planning not just cities and stopping at their boundaries, but looking at the regions around them. And the first regional plan for New York published in 1929 
looks at a region that runs from Trenton, New Jersey to New Haven, Connecticut. Um, 30, uh, I believe it's 31 counties. Um, uh, breathtaking in its vision. Uh, it's, I'm sure it's in your library at Montclair State and the other schools represented here. I encourage you to go look at it. But the, the thoughts about regionalization didn't stop at the uh, metropolitan boundary. Benton McKay, the man pictured here, a student of Gifford Pinchot's, if you've studied the Forest Service, um, uh, published in the 1920s a book uh, called The New Exploration, where he proposed a trail along the crest line of the Appalachian Mountains from Katahdin in Maine to Springer Mountain in Georgia. You, you know that trail, many of you have hiked on it, but when Benton McKay proposed it, he thought of it not just as a hiking trail, he thought of it as a design feature for the eastern half of the continent. The idea that a spine of, uh, of hiking trail would, would, would run down the middle of a conservation zone of national forests and national parks that would then play off into agricultural lands that, that would then roll into the cities of the East Coast and the upper and the Midwest. Um, that Benton McKay had the idea that he was designing a continent and that we should take that level of regionalism uh, to do the designs of our, of, of our urban life so that we wouldn't have an, a continuous um, uh, industrial city that moved throughout the country. Well, so let me move from the principles of U.S. planning that got us to where we are today uh, to some of the circumstances of, of cities globally as we are in the midst of this era of tremendous rapid urbanization. As we sit here today in 2020, there are about a billion people in the world who live in uh, informal settlements. What uh, most people think of as slums. Uh, there are about a billion people in the world who lack potable water. There are about two and a half billion people in the world who lack adequate sanitation. Uh, the UN projections are that by mid-century we will have 200 million climate refugees, 200 million people who no longer can live in their homes and are leaving looking for other places to live because the climate is too hot or their, or their home sites are flooded. And we have had in the past 20 years, we have had a 75, uh, we, we have seen an increase in inequality in 75% of the cities in the world. Extreme poverty in Africa, for example, has increased from 205 million people in 1981 to 414 million people 10 years ago. So our cities have enormous challenges yet people keep coming to them and urban populations keep growing. Why? Because cities are places of opportunity. They're places where people go to get better jobs. They're, people, they're places people go to get a better education. And the movement to cities is something that um, we will not change. Many countries have tried to slow it down, to redirect it, but people go where the jobs are, they go where the schools are, they go where the, the, the cultural institutions are, they go where healthcare is and that brings them to cities. Um, and indeed, cities drive the global economy. We said cities are 55% of the world's population today. They are 80% of gross domestic product, 80% of the economy. So they overperform uh, in economic terms compared to rural areas. And um, this is true everywhere. These, uh, these UN habitat charts show you a comparison of GDP to, po to population in a number of cities in the world, the chart on the left looks at cities in developed countries, the chart on the right cities in developing countries. And you see that cities outperform population in, in city economy outperforms population everywhere, but it does that much more in the developing world than it does in the industrial countries. And, and that undoubtedly is the driver of why so many people move to the cities. So, the question I'd like to ask is, given that level of rapid urbanization, are we up to the task in terms of how we develop and plan our cities to be able to respond to that level of, of population growth? And in order to answer that question, I'd like to compare two different kinds of, of, of ways we think of planning in a city. The first is the notion of a so-called planned city, a city that has a master vision, a city where national leadership has, uh, has 
determined where the city needs to go. So it's a top-down kind of planning. Um, a city that, that bases its plans primarily on physical design, on land use um, and, uh, and urban design. And contrast that with a second kind of planning uh, that is less concerned with a master vision and more with an ongoing process. We talk about the notion of a city that plans, to borrow a term from Clara Arazabel, um, uh, the, the notion that it is not the plan itself that is so important, but it is the process of planning, of collecting data, of analyzing data, of taking input from people about where they want to go, of negotiating consensus, um, and of doing this across the full range of municipal activities, not just land use and urban design, but also infrastructure, jobs, uh, education, housing, and so on. And so um, the UN Habitat has in the last five years been very active, actually since 2006 at the uh, World Urban Forum in Vancouver, has been active in promoting planning that embraces a wide scale participation of all of the different constituents who live in the city, of planning that integrates across all of the different sectors of economy and society and culture that are involved in, uh, in placemaking and, and urban life. Um, and planning that is done at the neighborhood level, at the city level, at the metropolitan level, at the national level, and even as in the case of, um, of uh, the uh, bi-national planning uh, done for the Great Lakes in, in North America and Canada, even at supranational, multinational levels. Um, so that's the vision that Habitat has for the kind of planning we should be doing. That vision is, is detailed out in a document called International Guidelines for Urban and Territorial Planning, which Habitat published in 2015. Um, uh, and it stands, and it is, is used in many of the policies that Habitat has adopted in recent years and that the UN has adopted in recent years. But the realities of urban development and city planning are that in many places, those principles are not what is used. In many places, planning is top down. In many places, key constituents are excluded from the planning process, especially women, the elderly, youth, minorities, indigenous peoples. Um, uh, planning is often uh, geared toward physical design. Uh, and, and these are the kinds of things that we talk about as being essential to, uh, to focus on in order to improve the quality of planning and produce better cities in this era of rapid urbanization. So the United Nations has been um, dramatically involved in trying to create templates, policies, guidelines that will help cities and nations around the world and, and advocacy groups to respond to these challenges and make the future of our cities and our rural areas better. You know about the sustainable development goals adopted in 2015. I wanna focus your attention on SDG 11, uh, sustainable cities and communities which is the one that's, that's most central to, to the art of city building. But to accomplish SDG 11, we have to have uh, engagement with so many of all, uh, really all of the other SDGs, but um, especially um, zero hunger, good health, quality education, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, um, uh, infrastructure, uh, climate action, uh, life on land, um, and, and so forth. We can't do SDG 11 unless we deliver on all 17 of the SDGs. But the UN didn't stop with the sustainable development goals. 2015 was something of a breakthrough year. It's also the year that the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly. It's also the year that the Addis Ababa Accord on Financing and Development was adopted by the UN. I already mentioned the International Guidelines and Urban Territorial Planning, also from 2015. And it is the year that the Paris Climate Accords were adopted. Um, and, and then a year later, we adopted, the, the UN Habitat adopted the New Urban Agenda, uh, the document that, uh, that sets forth an implementation uh, protocol for SDG 11. 
So the United Nations is pushing hard in many pieces of this, uh, of this program. How well have we been doing? Well, you know, on the one hand, there has been enormous progress in many countries. On the other hand, when we look at the target date of 2030 and the need in this decade of action between now and 2030 to, to, to meet the demands of these 17 SDGs, we're really not doing very well at all. This graphic from the uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network uh, tries to summarize performance in the different world regions and in the different uh, income groups of countries. And um, I'll, I'll call your attention to the high income category on the bottom line, the one that the United States falls in. And uh, you can see that the high income countries are doing well on some of the SDGs, on poverty, not surprising, on quality education, on infrastructure, uh, but are lagging well behind in re responsible consumption and production and in climate action. And, and then when you look at the less wealthy countries in the world, the low income, low middle and upper middle income countries, um, the, the situation is much more dire. Um, you see a series of red lines across the low income country line that, uh, that reflects the fact that uh, so many of those countries just don't have the resources to be able uh, to, to meet the demands of the SDGs in their current context. And, uh, and, and even the, the progress toward the goals is very limited. I know you're interested in how the United States does and SDSN publishes these kinds of data for uh, these summaries, but also the raw data for all of the countries, well, about 165 of the 193 UN member states. The United States is on in this alphabetical uh, list of the OECD countries, the industrial countries is on the bottom line. And you can see uh, that the United States performs very poorly on hunger, performs very poorly um, on uh, inequality, performs very poorly on uh, uh, resource consumption and production and on climate action and on peace justice um, uh, and on partnerships. Um, so we have a lot of challenges here in this country, uh, certainly compared to our wealth. And, and this, this is the, the other countries on this chart, the OECD countries are the ones that have incomes that look something like ours. And you can see that many of them do much better than we do. So we have a lot of challenges. Do we have the workforce uh, to live up, to be able to carry out and respond effectively to these challenges. Well, this is UN Habitat data on the number of planners in different countries around the world. And they, it starts with the United Kingdom where they have 38 accredited planners per 100,000 population. And most people think the UK does a pretty good job of urban planning. Our country, the United States, we have 17 planners per 100,000 in this same data collection ep uh, episode or exercise. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, almost all the countries hover around one per 100,000 as Nigeria does here. And in, in other parts of the world, including South Asia, the numbers are much less. India is 0.23 planners per 100,000 population. Now, I don't know what the right number is. I don't know if 17 or 38 is enough or too many, but I know that one is too few and that uh, many regions of the developing world have nothing resembling uh, the kind of workforce that they need uh, in planning, in architecture, in surveying, in engineering, in all of the built environment professions, as well as many others to be able to rise to the challenge of the SDGs. And frankly, folks, this is where you, the green team members come in. We need you to join this workforce and to contribute to finding solutions in this decade of action. I'm gonna stop there. Let's uh, turn things back over to our hosts. Thank you.
Dr. Stiftel, thank you so very much. I think um, this really sets in context the trajectory, you know, a look um, going backward and, and um, a hope going forward. So, you know, we always like to um, look toward that hope and what can be done and the action. And I think you've really laid it out. These are sobering data, sobering statistics and, and information that really is motivating um, to try to help our students uh, to have a pretty clear cut path um, to be able to address the, the challenges ahead. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. Pleasure to be um, here. Look forward to the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Yeah, so now on to the hope and we would like to um, turn this over now to the Newark Science and Sustainability Green Team. Um, this is a nonprofit organization in the city of Newark that um, you'll hear more about, but um, we've been working with for a period of time now and they've done so many projects and such very cool technology, um, building out urban agriculture and all kinds of things. So I'm going to let them share it with you. I'm very excited for you to hear about this. Hello, we are a PSCG, Institute for Sustainability Studies, green team serving Newark Science and Sustainability. We would like to introduce ourselves. My name is Kiara Brady. I'm a media and communications major from Rampo College of New Jersey. Hi, my name is Amalka Clinton. I am a computer science major at Mount Clay State University. Hello, my name is Julia Flores. I'm an industrial design major at New Jersey Institute of Technology. Hi, I'm Robert Sunbury, and I'm an electrical computer engineering major at Rowan University. Hi, I'm Brittany Portes, and I am an environmental science student at Marist College. To begin, I'd like to explain the background of New York Science and sustain Sustainability, also known as New York SAS. New York SAS is a community-driven 501c3 nonprofit organization located in Newark, New Jersey. The organization was founded by Tobias Fox back in 2012, who can be seen in the upper right image. Tobias's passion for increased food accessibility gave rise to the creation of two community gardens, the People's Garden and the Garden of Hope. These community gardens aim to implement various initiatives to increase environmental awareness through their five pillars, renewable energy, urban agriculture, eco art, wellness and nutrition, and ecological building. To continue the mission that Newark SAS is dedicated to, the team has conducted research to gain a greater understanding of food insecurity and other accessibility issues in Newark. Here, you can see that Newark's average annual household income is about $25,000 less than the average annual household income throughout the US. Also, 82.8% .8 of the city's children rely on free or reduced cost lunch, and this might be the only moderately healthy meal they receive that day. <clears throat> Imagine how situations like COVID more so affect the scarcity of access to proper food while schools are closed. On top of this, 25% of all Newark residents rely on public transportation, and when the entire city only has a handful of larger scale grocery stores, this is extremely difficult for proper food distribution in a large food desert. Ultimately, to combat such important issues within the community, this year's green team worked to increase the efficiency of the Garden of Hope with technological implementations. Each deliverable aims to contribute to the achievement of a high functioning organization and includes new software selection, data collection, and an employee data hub for a proficient delivery of fresh produce to a disproportionately affected area. This mix of technology and agriculture provides easier strategies for day-to-day -day operations in the garden, and more importantly, increases education within the community with technology that isn't commonly seen or utilized by Newark residents. Along with this, deliverables revolve around infographic creation, mapping gardens associated with um, the newer community food, guard, um, food systems, and development of digital media to increase residents' awareness of such important community-driven initiatives. In that, it will increase awareness of access to fresh produce and enable a stronger connection between individuals within a city through agriculture. Now, my colleagues will explain our methods for completing these deliverables and later discuss them more in depth. So as for the methods we use to accomplish these deliverables, in order to showcase and make it easier for the organization to keep track of what's going on in their garden and what type of food they're outputting, 
we did a lot of research and looking at various softwares that they could use in order to keep track of all these things and export them to spreadsheets, as well as keeping track of what communities and people they're reaching. In order to make it so that they could keep track of their data no matter where they, they are in the world, we researched various cloud storage solutions and ended up using SQL for database management and Python to send and retrieve the data. So SQL is a database management software that essentially lets you store large table, tables like Excel sheets on the internet and use queries from various programming languages in order to pull the data back down to wherever you want to implement it. We also conducted ethnographic research, which is actually going into an environment and talking to the people who live there and find out what their struggles are and what they need to make their lives better directly from the source. In order to accomplish our deliverables of creating promotional videos and content, we use storyboards, we create and receive footage and develop videos using Adobe Premiere and Audition. And lastly, in order to create maps and diagrams of the garden that they have, we use drone imaging and geographic information systems, also known as GIS, in order to create these infographics and maps. Currently displayed on the screen is the Farming Concrete Barn. The Farming Concrete Barn is a data management and collection software used to track and measure urban agriculture, agriculture data nationwide. By recommending the software to New York SAS, they will now be better able to organize their data beyond crop tracking. This software allows New York SAS to track environmental, health, social, and economic data, which can be easily downloaded as a chart or an Excel sheet to share with local residents, communities, and the city of Newark. Here you see site infographics for the People's Garden, another garden facilitated by Tob Tobias Fox. This specifically lays out the site plan for the garden for visitors to receive a clear graphic representation of what produce is being grown, what amenities are provided, and easy navigation to these facilities located on the premises. Ideally, these will be placed on the website for reference and posted at the front entrance of each garden. Along with this, detailed plant cards were created to identify plant name, Latin binomial, and Spanish translation to, get, to cater to Newark's demographic. These images were created with Adobe Illustrator software and utilized city maps, the garden design plans, and drone images taken by team members. Visuals like these aid with plant identification to get members, especially youth participants, more familiar with fresh produce. Next, Robert will, will further explain our efforts in capturing the environmental data of the gardens. So in our case, we needed to come up with a method and system in order to constantly keep track of what's going on in the garden. And so we needed a way to collect the data and then a way to upload the data and then a way to pull the data back to a website. So we, what we used to handle the data collection part is a device you can see in the bottom right called a Raspberry Pi. It's essentially a very small computer. It would fits in the palm of your hand and it can do pretty much everything a regular computer can do. It just has the added benefit of exposed pins you can see at the top known as general purpose in out or GPIO pins, which you can hook up directly to sensors which can, which can do any manner of things such as gathering a temperature, the humidity, the soil humidity, water levels, air quality, whatever sensors you need in order for any application, you can most likely find them somewhere on the internet for purchase. And then, so once the, we gather the data from the sensors, which is interpreted through Python, we use queries with, in SQL to upload it, the data to Google Cloud, which is then stored for later website use. Displayed on the screen is an interactive map which displays the gardens a part of the Newark Community Food Systems, also known as the NCFS. Now on the next slide, we can see that the Newark Community Food System is a nonpartisan collective of deeply engaged community leaders that supports and develops sustainability efforts in urban agriculture, wellness, and nutrition in Newark, New Jersey. On the right side of the map are green pinpoints, which indicate the locations of the NCFS gardens. When a pin is selected, a logo image will be displayed on the left, along with its location, website link, contact information, and a brief description 
of what can be found at the following gardens. The upper right NCFS logo provides the residents direct access to the NCFS website where they can learn about its mission statement and how they too can help. The creation of an interactive map allows for interested residents to easily access the resources related to food, health, and volunteerism, while also increasing the easeability to finding community gardens in their area. This map can be found on the redeveloped Newark SAS website. To accomplish our goal of data collection, we built a website that can only be accessed by Newark SAS employees if they have the right credentials. The purpose of the website is to showcase the environmental variables in the greenhouse. This is important because knowing how healthy each environmental variable is can both save money, resources, and time. Google Cloud provides Newark SAS an opportunity to be more technically efficient because we are able to use few resources and still be able to provide great results of becoming more sustainable. For the third deliverable, we were asked to create three promotional videos for Newark SAS. We were able to use Adobe Premiere and Audition to create this media. Some of the videos consist of a highlight of the community support agriculture program, testimonials of the volunteers, and a general organizational highlight video. All of the videos are short enough to be used on any of Newark SAS's online platforms. Here's a sample from the CSA video. So in 2018, we launched our Farm to Table Co-op, which mirrors a Community Supported Agriculture or CSA program. And this is a way for us to create a distribution system within the urban agriculture initiative that we have. So we manage two community gardens. We grow a lot of food, but a lot of that food was being wasted in the garden because we didn't have a distribution system in place. So this allows people to make an advance payment of $395. And in return, they receive 20 week produce packages, a feeding of two to four people. And so those 20 weeks fall over an expand of June up until the end of October or sometimes early November. And so then we decided to launch our Sponsor a Family initiative. And this allows a person that likes what we're doing and want to purchase a membership for the whole purpose of donating it to a family in need. And so this helps us to increase healthy food access to residents through community support agriculture, AKA CSA. We were able to use these past several weeks to combine our skills and help the Newark Science and Sustainability Organization. We created technology, drew up maps using GIS software, cultivated a working employee website, and made videos. All of these help to continue the organization's mission of providing the newer community with access to renewable energy, urban agriculture, eco art, wellness and nutrition, and ecological building. We would also like to thank the various organization representatives and program managers for their continued support throughout the summer. Thank you. What a fantastic uh, group of projects. I, there's no end to what you can do with a vacant lot. And so thanks so much to Tobias Fox for inspiring this and what a, what a well-rounded and extensive group of projects. Thank you, Team Newark Science and Sustainability. Um, next up, we um, have the team that, that was um, hosted by New Jersey Natural Gas and New, New Jersey Natural Gas hosted two teams last year that each did very, very different projects. And this year, the projects that this team did are yet again, very, very different. So there's quite a diversity with the, the kinds of projects that, that um, we're able to do in partnership with New Jersey Natural Gas. And we're grateful for that opportunity. And I'll let them tell you about their projects this summer. Team New Jersey Natural Gas. Hello, we're the PSEG uh, uh, Institute for Sustainability Studies Green Team serving New Jersey Natural Gas concerning energy efficiency. Let's meet the team. I'm Stephanie Brown. I'm a graphic design major at Monmouth University. I'm Diana Damati. I'm a digital marketing major at William Patterson University. I'm Tyler McLemore. I'm an electrical and computer engineering major at Rowan University. I'm Tess Turner. I'm an international studies and political science major at Johns Hopkins University. 
And I'm Dylan White. I'm a business administration major at Montclair State University. Starting with an introdu introduction to our company, whose main goal is to support these energy efficiency efforts, New Jersey Natural Gas is a principal subsidiary of New Jersey Resources. They've served more than a half a million customers in the Burlington, Middlesex, Monmouth, Morris, and Ocean counties of New Jersey. And their general mission is to help improve the quality of life by using different means of education, healthy living, and environmental sustainability. We've also been working with the Save Green Project, their program that is operated and monitored by New Jersey Natural Gas. And they provide generous rebates and financial incentives to help support New Jersey Natural Gas's projects. Lastly, Sustainable Jersey. They're a separate organization supporting municipalities towards their sustainable development. They research the best practices for what a community could and should do to help contribute to a more sustainable future. This summer, our team promoted energy efficiency to Ocean Gate, Home Dell, and Point Pleasant Beach through the New Jersey Natural Gas's Home Energy Analysis and Direct Install Program for Businesses. We created outreach materials to target the residential and commercial sectors of each municipality, and we use sustainable Jersey points as initiative for the municipalities to follow through with the program. We did some background research on each municipality before working with them, just to get a better idea of who we were targeting in our outreach materials. For example, Ocean Gate only has 13 commercial businesses, so they only need one business to participate in the direct install program to gain the sustainable Jersey points. So we made sure to, out, to highlight that in our outreach materials for commercial businesses. So how can this benefit you? Well, there are two main benefits that we've identified. The first is reduced utility costs. Um, and the second is reduced energy usage. And these two things go hand in hand. Uh, if you're using appliances that are more energy efficient, then of course your utility bill is going to go down. Long-term effects are things like reduced greenhouse gases, because if you're consuming less energy, then we are producing less energy. Uh, there's also the habitability side of things. If you have uh, better insulation in your home, then you're exposed to less extremes in, in temperature. Uh, better HVAC systems reduce air pollution and mold, and you also see reduced amount of pests in your homes and businesses. This all leads to a safer, more affordable, and more sustainable form of housing. And we believe this all ties into the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which were talked about earlier, and you can see on the right. And to exemplify the importance of energy efficiency, here are some changes the average household could make. If you turn down your thermostat one degree in the, in the winter, it could save about $23 annually. And it could also save about 118 kilograms of CO2 which is also equivalent to about driving about 287 miles. And to put that in perspective, the average car mileage is about 21 miles per gallon. Additionally, uh, an average household does about 10 loads of laundry per week. If they are instead done in cold water, it could save about $59 annually, which is 228 kilograms of CO2, which is driving about 551 miles. And lastly, if the average household switched all their light bulbs to LEDs, it could save about $180 annually, which is 678 kilograms of CO2, which is driving 1,650 miles. Our team used a few different approaches to meet our company deliverables. First, we used initial, initial research. This was done to gather existing information on municipality websites and community metrics. Some of the variables that we found most interesting were the size of the population, the average household income, the average number of businesses, and the average age of that population. We did this research to better understand how to promote these programs to each of the municipalities. We then added qualitative research with case studies and customer testimonials. With this research, we would conduct an analysis with the information that we found from the testimonials, such as cost of the projects, project types, the incentives that they received, as well as the annual and monthly savings on their utility bills. We use different means of communication, such as email and Zoom meetings with our company representatives, our municipality green team members, and the mayor of Ocean Gate. And lastly, we've used our community outreach. This was to create infographics, customized templates, and our informative video. These, uh, these materials would be provided to New Jersey Natural Gas and the municipalities to use at their own discretion. One project we worked on this summer was developing a survey using Qualtrics pertaining to direct install. We created the survey to be held for later use that could be used to contact businesses after they had undergone the direct install process to understand what their returns looked like, 
as well as what motivated them to undergo the process initially. We hope this information could be used to better inform outreach approaches moving forward. Here is another project. This is process photos of our flyer promoting the home energy assessment. And this project also helped us discover that we wanted to make a video promoting the home energy analysis as well. We also produced many commercial materials for um, using sustainable Jersey templates for towns to use for outreach about regarding the energy efficiency programs. And here are some examples. The first is an Ocean Gate tax bill insert that was actually sent to all Ocean Gate residents in their most recent tax bill describing the home performance with Energy Star program. Another is a Home Dell newsletter insert, which uh, Home Dell plans to include in their quarterly newsletter. And the final one is a website insert. We found that many green teams did Many municipalities did not have green team web pages describing these programs, and this is an example um, describing these residential programs as well. These templates were meant to be easy to use and easy to distribute to tap into existing as well as new outreach platforms. And here are some infographics the team made using Canva and Ficta chart of energy tips. We made these for the municipalities to use either on their green teams web page or on social media to make people more aware of the energy saving things that they can do. This is a screenshot of a video we created for OceanGate. And it's a video presentation detailing the home energy analysis program that New Jersey Natural Gas offers. And this video will be shown at the next virtual town hall meeting that OceanGate has, actually today at seven. So all residents will get a better idea of what the program is and if they wanna participate in it. And with this video, along with the tax bill insert we mentioned earlier, Ocean Gate is eligible for their first ever sustainable Jersey points. And here's the kinetic type video promoting the home energy analysis. We decided to make it very typographically based because to, to really show the information and I'll just play that for you now. There's nothing better than relaxing comfortably at home, but have you ever considered how efficient your house really is? Maybe it's time for a home energy checkup. We can help you learn how to make your home more comfortable and save up to 30% on your energy bills. It's easy with a $49 home energy analysis from the Save Green Project at New Jersey Natural Gas. One of our certified auditors will conduct an analysis of your whole house, inspecting your HVAC and water heating equipment, insulation, windows, doors, and more. Then when they're done, you'll receive a detailed report that lets you know where energy is escaping in your home and opportunities to save even more. You'll even receive an energy score that lets you know how efficient your home is. Plus, we'll let you know about financial incentives to help pay for any recommended improvements. Use your report to correct small fixes yourself or to get competitive bids from qualified contractors for larger home energy efficiency projects. And after your analysis, we'll even provide you with free low-cost measures, including a power strip and LED light bulbs to help you get started on the road to energy savings. When you're ready to start saving energy and money, we're here to help. Give us a call at 877-455-NJNG to schedule your $49 home energy analysis. That's 877-455-NJNG. So in conclusion, we were able to help three different municipalities, that's Ocean Gate, Home Dell, and Point Pleasant Beach Borough. Uh, and in the case of Ocean Gate, as you heard earlier, we were able to give them their first ever sustainable Jersey points. Um, but of course, all were able to, to secure the points as well as the residential outreach program. We were able to fill a gap that we had seen in these green teams for these municipalities. They we're doing all the things that they need to be doing in order to get the points, but they lack the materials and or the manpower uh, to do this communication, uh, the materials for the outreach and the education, of course, in this case. Um, so by filling that gap, we were able to assist them in this program and help them get these points. For our future recommendations, after working so hard on these projects, we really do see the many benefits that these programs have to offer and how much they really help commercial businesses and residents. But for the future, we do recommend that New Jersey Natural Gas continues working closely with each of these municipalities to help guide and address each of the many components to their programs. We also found through our research and discussion with community members that while people were really motivated by potential returns and savings, they also really valued other more holistic benefits of energy efficiency as well. 
people cared about the environment, the health of their homes and of their communities. And we really emphasize that future outreach should prioritize a holistic view of energy efficiency. And finally, we also recommend a more streamlined process of data collection and testimonial collection after the audit and direct install processes, because this data is really crucial in both understanding and communicating the impacts of both of these programs. We'd like to take a moment to thank all these people on this slide. They've been a massive help to us throughout the project and this would not have been possible without them. Uh, all these people have put in a lot of time and energy into helping us achieve all of our goals with this project. Thank you. And we also like to take a moment to thank our funders. Great job, Team New Jersey Natural Gas. Thank you so much for the um, all of those ideas. And now we see how um, even the projects with the corporations have focused a lot on communities this year. And I think it's a, a good time to be focused on communities given um, many of our global events. So. Um, you'll see a little bit more as we move on into our next presentation. We're so pleased this year to begin working with the Northern New Jersey Community Foundation and um, working on food waste in some communities in Bergen County. So you'll hear now from the Northern New Jersey Community Foundation team. Hello everyone. We are the PSEG Institute for Sustainability Studies Green Team serving the Northern New Jersey Community Foundation. And our green team consists of myself, Dave Guevara, and I am a nutrition and food science major at Montclair State University. And I'm Daniel Ivanov, a biochemistry major out of NJIT. I'm Elizabeth Nemec, a chemical engineering major at Rutgers University. My name is Hadar Pepperstone. I'm an environmental science student at SUNY Plattsburgh. I am Anthony Ruiz, an environmental planning and landscape architecture student at Rutgers University. For this project, we focus our research on organic waste reduction and organic waste refers to yard waste and food waste. And through our research, we found that organic waste, specifically food waste, is a huge issue because it makes up 22% of New Jersey's landfill. And it also contributes to the release of methane within the atmosphere. Although by diverting the food waste from these landfills, it can be used to produce other things such as energy and fertilizer. And a little bit about Northern New Jersey Community Foundation is that they were founded in 1998 and they have a variety of projects which encourage collaboration within the community, which goes back to their model, what can we do together that we can't do alone? And for our project, we chose three municipalities within Bergen County to focus on, which include Ridgewood, Glen Rock, and Fairlawn. And we included a map of where each municipality is located within the county. The projects that we worked on include developing a closed loop food system model, analyzing organic waste generated by each municipality, evaluating economics of proposed systems, and then proposed food waste reduction strategies. As you can see here, the first thing we did was to develop a conceptual closed loop food system model. Starting in the top right with education, we found this to be really essential to the success of the program. Moving on to sourcing, which is where the food waste comes from, particularly homes and businesses. The food waste then needs to be collected either through a drop-off location or a pickup service like standard trash. It is then taken towards going to be processed either at a facility like a composting facility or an anaerobic digester. Then the products from that process, such as compost, can be used in residential locations or community gardens and green spaces. And in the case that that compost is used to grow more food, that food can go back to the sources, closing the loop. We began our research by analyzing the municipal solid waste generated per municipality by looking at the past five years and calculating an average. Now, using this average, uh, we used the NGDEP's 22% of landfill waste as food waste and applied it to this average to then calculate a rough estimate of how much food waste is actually being generated per municipality. We also looked into current policy within the state, such as a recent bill that will be coming into effect in October of 2021, that says that any food waste generator of 52 tons or more must try to divert the uh, food waste from a landfill if a recycling facility is available within 25 miles. New Jersey also put a 50% food waste reduction goal by 2030 that started in 2017. And uh, any food waste that is recycled within New Jersey has to be done so at a class C facility that is permitted to accept food waste. Currently there's only four of those in New Jersey and only one of those is operational. 
We proposed some changes such as local incentives for business partners uh, that fit into the closed loop system, uh, such as, for example, a vertical garden and long-term state and county planning. We got that idea because in 2012, Vermont made Act 148, which set an eight year timeline that allowed them to reach zero food waste by 2020. We think that that would be very beneficial for either the state or for Bergen County to implement. As mentioned previously, we found education to be really essential to the success of the program since this system relies on residents. So we need to inform residents about their impact that they have personally regarding food waste and then provide them with tools to change their behavior. Those tools, we recommend multiple methods of outreach, including workshops, some of which already exist, and expanding those to include topics like how to reduce food waste at home, as well as outreach materials that to be published, such as the flyers you see to the right. Ultimately, the goal of education is to see a reduction in residential food waste. And since we're talking about residential food waste, you need to create an informed and engaged public through education. We also looked into a different pricing model for any uh, residential waste removal. So we're talking about all waste here. Currently, the three municipalities, they charge a tax for all residents and residents don't really see how much of that tax is going into uh, waste reduction and waste removal. So it pays you throw instead, or unit-based pricing. Uh, it treats waste as a uh, utility in the same way that you pay for your water or gas based off how much you use. So in the same way that you might put a solar panel on your roof to reduce your electric cost, or I'm not allowed to touch my thermostat at home because then uh, we'll have too much of a gas bill. Pays you throw encourages residents directly to reduce their waste. Uh, from different studies that we've looked into, a minimum reduction is seen of 20 to 30 percent without any recycling and composting within the municipalities. And once munis uh, municipalities implement recycling and composting, there's an average of 44 percent waste reduction. Um, the municipalities, if we just go back one slide, the municipalities uh, that we talked to have um, been worried about illegal dumping and a lack of compliance, but different case studies and different studies have shown that that's rarely ever happens as soon as proper ordinances are in place. We also looked into the tipping fees so that if a 20, 30%, uh, 20 or 30, 44% reduction is implemented and thus the municipalities don't have to pay for that much um, waste to be removed, uh, there's different savings that can be realized within the municipalities. And because the pays you through a system that savings would be realized by the, the residents themselves. And for Fairlawn, for example, the largest municipality, they would see up to one and a half million dollars in savings. Uh, composting can be relatively simple to implement and a pay-as-you-throw system would incentivize backyard composting. This method diverts food waste destined for landfills with something as simple as a separate bin to uh, hold uh, any vegetable or fruit scraps. These scraps would then uh, become compost, electricity, or animal feed. However, in, to prop, so in order to properly produce electricity, a larger scale municipal uh, composter will be needed. We met with Tidy Planet and discussed the rocket composters. The first smaller system is able to process one ton per day of food waste with a 5.4 year payback period. Whereas the larger system is able to process three tons per day of food waste with a 3.1 year payback period. Now these systems have minimal operating costs with labor needing at least two to three hours. And these systems are also self-sustaining and relatively small, or they could easily be implemented into an existing recycling facility. Now, these municipalities can have one unit or potentially expand the system to implement more composters or potentially an anaerobic digestion. Anaerobic digestion breaks down organic materials using microorganisms. Now, these results into biogas, which is the natural gas being released from the food waste, gray water, the moisture being separated from the solids, and digestates being the leftover dried solid. And each of these materials could be used as an energy source. We met with Bioenergy Devco, the producer of an anaerobic digester and discussed their system. This system is much larger and requires 15 to 20 workers needed with a minimum of five acres. However, it can process much more food tons with 10,000 tons per year. Anaerobic digestion is recommended as a long-term county solution due to its size and stature compared to a municipal composter, but as well as collaboration required between municipalities in order to to pull together their resources and reduce their food waste while producing a renewable energy source. So there are also community components that contribute to the overall system, as well as the collaboration of towns and community members. 
Farmers markets, vertical farms, and community gardens can allow for possible food waste reduction by localizing food growth and distribution, as well as reducing transportation costs and requirements. These systems also provide a location for certain aspects of education, such as small workshops or handing out informational uh, brochures. Community gardens can provide a place for compost, assuming that a larger scale composting system was established. And then in the case that it wasn't, uh, backyard composting can be an alternative for residents to utilize their own food waste. Um, each of these components are recommendations for initial action or expansion in the case that municipalities already have some so that they can approach their environmental goals. We developed a timeline for the municipalities to follow that shows the big picture and we broke it down into the short term, midterm and long term um, components. Short term includes education and municipal action, such as the pay as you throw system or community gardens. Um, next would be the collection and distribution systems, which take a bit longer to implement, but are based off of those initial municipal actions. And then long term would consist of large scale systems, such as a countywide facility that requires a lot more collaboration, and that would be like the composter or anaerobic digester. Future recommendations include focusing on reducing waste and education to allow for more immediate action and results. Um, proposing a system efficiently is very important uh, to begin the implementation, especially for a complex system so that it can be um, installed as quickly as possible. And then further research on a countywide facility is important to eventually plan for collaboration on a larger scale. So we talked about a number of things this morning, things we were able to look into over the summer. First was the impact of food waste, especially the environmental impact and how significant that is. We also looked at our closed loop system that we developed and how that can be integrated into, into existing pieces and towns. We analyzed the food waste and waste of these towns of Glenrock, Ridgewood, and Fairlawn, and showed that, especially on the scale of a town with thousands of people, the impact of food waste becomes really significant. We introduced the pay-as-you-throw system, which can be implemented in cities relatively simply and have a really significant impact on waste reduction. The importance of education and collaboration cannot be underscored enough, and it also goes back to the Northern New Jersey Community Foundation central question of what can we do together that we can't do alone. And finally, we looked at steps that, became, that, became, that can be taken towards larger scale achievements, such as, such as community composters and anaerobic digesters. Finally, we'd like to thank the Northern New Jersey Community Foundation, as well as the various green committees and uh, DPWs of the municipalities we worked with, and the Montclair State University PSEG ISS green teams. And finally, we'd like to thank our funders. Great work. Great work, team New Jersey, Northern New Jersey Community Foundation. Um, I know that the work that you've done is serving as the basis um, for future work already. So excellent job. Um, and so we would like to invite the audience to continue adding questions into the um, chat. And we have um, one more speaker up next. So we're going to spend about 10 minutes with a Q&A. And then we'll hear some closing remarks from Trina Malik from the Nature Conservancy. Um, so first off, we'll start with you, Northern New Jersey Community Foundation. We have a two-part question. Um, first off, can you say a little bit more what qualifies as a Class C facility? And then secondly, um, can, do you have some ways that you could share that rocket composters can be sustainable? I'll answer the Class C facility part. Um, so under the DEP regulations, there's different types of recycling facilities. A class C facility is one that accepts organic waste. So there are many class C facilities, but then there's permitting under the class C facility branch. So you would need specific permitting to accept food waste. So only four currently have that permitting, but only one of them is in operation according to the DEP. Great, thank you. And the part about the, compo the rocket composter. Is there a way to, you know, couple it with solar energy in order to make it sustainable, or is there another way to make it more sustainable? The rocket composters likely could be paired with, um, with an alternative energy source. That was not something that we addressed specifically, or that was mentioned specifically in our talk um, with Tidy Planet. Um, it does; they do run on electricity. So the smaller unit uses twenty is a twenty kilowatt hour system, and um, the larger is twenty five kilowatt hours. Um, so they, they could likely be plugged into an, a solar or alternative energy source. Great, thank you. And a question now for the Newark Science and Sustainability team. 
the question is about the Raspberry Pi. What is maintenance like for a Raspberry Pi? Once it's set up, does it have to be checked periodic periodically, frequently, or not at all? So the whole benefit of Raspberry Pi is partly they're very inexpensive. They, the models range from anywhere from $5 to around $30. And because the Raspberry Pi runs on a Linux-based operating system, they require a lot less maintenance than your normal Windows or Mac computer. So they would take just about as much maintenance as any other system that you would be planning to implement anywhere, of course, assuming that they're coded properly and you can schedule auto restarts and things along those lines, but they've been known to run for longer than a year without requiring any sort of reboots or maintenance. Thank you. Um, and we have a question now for the New Jersey natural gas team. Did the COVID-19 quarantine influence your advertising or communication planning at all so that um, with so many people staying home more now, um, did you change the way that you messaged um, the energy efficiency uh, advertisements that you put together? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I remember early meetings with the uh, municipalities and, and the people that we worked with, we talked about, oh, you know, in the past we've done advertisements in like City Hall because there's a lot of traffic in City Hall or there's a lot of traffic at the library. So what we could put up flyers that, oh, oh we can't do that. Um, so that was definitely a hurdle that we had to overcome early on. Uh, so, so of course we, we came up with new plans like the infographics were, were an early idea that we had making those and distributing them to the green teams for them to post on their social media. Um, other ideas like uh, the video idea because uh, you know sometimes you can't get people's attention with the infographics but this moving you know video with with action and, and audio and stuff like that that definitely will captivate people and will, it'll keep their attention um, and then there are other ideas there the ocean gate um, tax letter is one that we're particularly proud of um, ocean gate mailed out their their tax uh, letter to all their residents which means that uh, if we had an insert in that tax letter, it would be received by 100% of the residents in OceanGate. Um, so we worked really hard to do things, do things like that to um, try and maximize the number of people that we reach. Great, thank you. Um, so now um, a couple more questions for the Northern New Jersey Community Foundation team. Do you see anaerobic digestion exclusively as a county solution, county level solution? Or is there a scenario in which anaerobic digestion could be feasible for a single community? And while you're thinking about that, I'll add the second part to the question. Um, in your work, did you consider partnering with nonprofits to manage excess edible waste and potential donations from residents and maybe food manufacturers or um, supermarkets or restaurants? So for the first question from uh, the experts that we talked to, they were saying that anaerobic digestion is most efficient on a larger scale. There are you know, smaller scales that you could work with. I mean, they, but the company that we talked to said the minimum is about five acres that they would really consider before it really is profitable. Uh, it's also a fairly, you know, up and coming technology within New Jersey and the United States. So currently we haven't seen anything that would be too promising, but it could be on the horizon. Uh, as for working with different partners, definitely, because one of the main things that we want to focus on is source reduction. The composting and anaerobic digestion is great as a last resort, but the first thing you want to do is not waste that food. And then if you do already, if you already did buy that food, you'd have all that extra. Yes, you should be giving it to other people. You should be trying to donate it. Uh, the EPA has more data and more uh, guidelines on that that you could follow. Thank you. And now for anyone who wants to jump in, um, so this is for all three teams. Um, as teams of students working digitally, I guess virtually, um, what did you learn from each other during this process? What lessons will you carry on for uh, virtual work and digital work in the future? Um, I can elaborate a little bit on it. Working digitally and kind of working with diverse uh, backgrounds from the students, um, you really start to understand through the process of how each individual works. Um, you learn a lot about uh, how to use your time management wisely and you just really try to incorporate everybody's skills um, to really finish the end result. 
Yeah, if I might add to that as well, uh, I think it's important to not be discouraged by the online environment. It's still very possible to do your work, especially with the help from your coworkers and your friends. Uh, we were able to do our job just fine. We had the initial hurdles, but I think moving forward, I've, I've learned a lot about how to um, get over those hurdles or get over those hurdles faster. Um, and yeah, just you know, just keep your mind, uh, keep your eye on the prize, and, and keep working towards that end goal, just like Dylan said. Great. Do we have any other um, thoughts? Any other students that want to share what their, what your experience was like compared to maybe what you thought it might be like? I think for our team, a lot of us uh, are very visual learners. And when you're just staring at a computer and looking at someone else's face and you're trying to explain something and just no one's really getting it versus versus uh, if you're in person and just put it up on a whiteboard or on a sheet of paper. So we, we found solutions around that, trying to make you know infographics for each other to try to get points across and you know different uh, mechanisms that we've tried to use, but it, it, there is definitely a barrier to communication. Fantastic. Um, I guess what I can say from my perspective is that everyone was so productive. I was worried. Um, you're just working so hard, really long days and producing so much. So um, that's fantastic too. Um, I, I didn't know exactly um, what to expect when we started the the online it wasn't something that we planned when you interviewed um, and so it was something that we pivoted toward and i think everyone did an incredible job um, being resilient and i'll talk about that a little bit more in a in a couple of minutes so i think now we're gonna um uh ah, we'll turn to tess tess has a couple of thoughts she'd like to share, share with us yeah, I think the one thing that I was concerned about coming into an online platform was being kind of isolated. The benefits of working with a team like is having the input from your other team members. So I think that was like the one thing that we were worried about. And something that I think was great about this platform is everyone kind of had to deal with the same struggles, Zoom glitches and internet issues, cutouts, especially with the hurricane situation in the past 24 hours. And so I think it ended up actually being a really like good bonding experience. I know for my team as well. And we really were still able to facilitate those relationships really strongly, even though it was this weird digital world version. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing everyone. Um, so this, this concludes a portion of our, our program with the green team's presentations. However, we do have one more speaker. And so we'll now go to Amelia, who's going to introduce Trina. Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, we had an amazing set of Green Team's presentations today. I was, I was so excited to see them all come together, uh, especially in these last 24 hours with all the, the hurricane stuff. But I would like to uh, now introduce our last speaker who will address a wide variety of topics covered. Trina Malik currently holds a position as the Climate Change and Energy Policy Manager with the Nature Conservancy's New Jersey chapter. With over 10 years of experience in the sustainability field, she's dedicated to transform organizations so that they have a positive environmental and social impact. Ms. Malik started her career as a mechanical engineer and served as a risk manager at PricewaterhouseCoopers, was among the inaugural group initiating the climate group in New York, worked as a sustainability consultant at Allianz and is now employed by a conservation organization. She has a broad knowledge in sustainability with a particular focus in climate change, having worked across industries that include energy and financial services. She has worked in the private, private public and nonprofit sectors in New York, Switzerland and Germany. Ms. Malik earned her bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from University of Maryland, a master of engineering management and engineering technology from George Washington University, and an MBA in finance and international business from the Stern School of Business at New York University. Ms. Malik, please share your thoughts on the work presented today and that ahead of us. Thank you so much, Amelia, for that really generous introduction. I appreciate that. I enjoyed the green team presentations so much. I learned a tremendous amount but also I'm so inspired by all of them, each of them, and then collectively all the more so. I'm so ex excited and happy that the PSC and G Institute for Sustainability Studies exists. When I was a student a long time ago, sustainability was not a subject. It wasn't a course, it wasn't a major. So I'm so happy to see education evolve in this very important way. Kudos to Montclair State University for hosting this institute. So they laid the foundation and the groundwork, but to see these student teams take this opportunity and run with it is absolutely inspiring. I mean, all the skills that you have demonstrated individually and as a team 
is what it takes to solve our pressing challenges at a local level and at a global level as well. Um, you take the data analytic, the data analytics, the more technical, quantifiable raw data, and then you look at the problem and the solutions that can be achieved at a 360 way, looking at it from different angles. Um, and then with that, you have all come up with actionable items of how the, your recommendations can be implemented for systemic change. It's, it's really impressive. You did it with teamwork. You did it with a very diverse group as far as majors, the universities you're coming from, the geographic areas you're coming from. I love what Dylan said about keeping focused on the purpose. Um, there's a lot of optimism with the cl closing remarks of Tyler and Tess. I mean, you, you have to be really resilient and really adaptable with obviously in the middle of a global pandemic and all the restrictions that impose, but you used, uh, you made lemonade out of lemons. And so that's a very, very useful skill um, to say the least. So I have been working on climate change for almost 20 years and I've worked at it from a very, very global level and then all the way to a very, very local level as some of you have done, well, all of these projects have demonstrated how the benefit of local work. And I can say doing meaningful work at the most local level is the most difficult. Uh, you have to work with stakeholders that will be affected by your work directly. You're held accountable. You see the results, you see the failures, you see everything in between. So it is the hardest magnitude of work. And then once you have been successful at the local level, you're all the more effective in scaling your solutions at a broader geographic level. Um, when we think of sustainability, it can be very local, it can be very big. I mean, Professor Stiftel, Stiftel I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, presentation on cities, as Amy said, was very sobering, but this is the realities of how our cities are growing and how we need to change course a bit so that they are growing more sustainably. A um, few of the presentations addressed food insecurity. It is a big issue right now at a local and at a global level. Uh, we have 7 billion people in the world right now. That's projected to increase to 9 billion by 2050. So it's an issue that's only gonna be more exacerbated, especially with climate change and different agricultural inputs of weather and rain patterns. Um, so these systemic issues need to be looked at in the way that the green teams looked at their projects um, in the course of the past few months. There are others, natural resource scarcity. Um, there's problems, um, societal problems, racial inequality, economic inequality. Uh, we're dealing with the global pandemic. That's a sy systemic public health issue. So one thing I know from my experience in tackling climate change and working with my brothers and sisters working in, in these other uh, global challenges is the solutions all require a multidisciplinary teams-based full systems thinking approach. That's how we're going to get to the solutions. Um, in climate change, we need the, all the fields, we need the sciences, agriculture, engineering, economics, finance, the arts, government, journalism, um, the specific professions that we require are, we need architects, utility workers, we need fashion designers, insurance brokers, cosmetic creators, toy manufacturers, we need mayors, we need council members, we need teachers. Um, I'm so happy with what Gabby said that as, the, as the, I think her majors are English and communications, wasn't sure how she can add value. Well, mostly all the projects said how much communications and outreach and education was so key to their projects because one thing is the hard quantitative analysis, but then actually to be able to scale it and to reach audiences that need to be able to implement it and scale it in a way that's meaningful needs that communication. So you need the graphic designers, you need the writers, you need the poets, you need the artists, um, even outside of our jobs. What the roles that we play as community members or as family members, as a parent, there's a big responsibility as well um, to constantly be driving towards the solutions. So basically it's all hands on deck. Um, 
And some of us, you know, in my generation, we've learned in our existing jobs how to make, how to be effective, how to make change. Um, as Amelia mentioned, I started as an engineer. My first job was working in a coal-fired power plant. I was friends with coal miners. They would deliver the coal every Tuesday. Um, and I'm so happy that I had these relationships because it makes me more effective in what I do now in order to address climate change. So whether you know it or not, um, we're all part, we can all be part of the change. For those that are younger and looking to go into professions, um, you can be looking for something specifically focused on the solutions that you wanna be getting at it, whether it's food insecurity or climate change or the whole host of sustainability issues that need to be tackled. Or first, you go to what you're passionate about. I mean, the best marriage is what you're passionate about with what, with, with what you wanna achieve in order to have the most impact. So um, as Gabby learned, it, it, you don't ever think that your passion, what you love to do isn't relevant for the problems that you wanna solve. They're all relevant. I've seen that firsthand. Um, and that's how we're more effective too, by doing what we love. So this all may sound very overwhelming. It is all hands on deck. It, it, you know, um, achieving solutions to global challenges affects many corners of our lives. It is a lot, but no one person does all the things required to come up with solutions for sustainable, for sustainable solutions for big global problems. We each do our part um, and collectively we achieve the results. So projects by projects that we're all participating in is the progress that we need to see. Being in the climate change field for so long, I can tell you that having impact takes patience, it takes commitment, it takes diversity of perspectives and listening to one another. I mean, truly listening. So, you know, me hanging out with coal miners and working in a coal fired power plant. Um, and I've worked with Fortune 50 companies. I've worked with small community groups. I've worked with top financiers on Wall Street and small business owners on Main Street. Right now, I work for the Nature Conservancy. It's the world's largest NGO, but I've worked for an NGO that has three people in it. Um, as, as Amelia referenced to in my early days with the climate group. So what I've learned from this experience is that there's no one experience that comes up with the solutions or is the most effective. It takes all these different perspectives and understanding of one another's roles in our global society that we live in in order to come up with these sustainable solutions. Um, the other thing I've learned is, which you all have already experienced and have become adept at, at embracing is resiliency and being adaptable. Um, not only in circumstances such as a hurricane, a global pandemic, which is enough, but oftentimes we experience progress. So you've gone two steps forward, but then something can happen and you go four steps back. And so um, I love what Dylan said about keeping our, your purpose in mind. I mean, for me, my North Star has always been to, um, I want to, I want to limit Earth's warming. Um, I don't want it to exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius because that's what the science tells us that we need to do in order to ward off the catastrophic effects of climate change. So in anything I've done in all of my roles, that's what I keep in mind. And that's the lens that through which I do it. Um, and because I can't do it alone, no way. No, no, if you ever hear anybody say that, run, go the other direction because that's definitely not possible. So then you work with others who have different, they have complementary skills and, and strengths and expertise. The other thing that was so impressive about today was the quality of the presentations. I mean, it's one thing to do the hard work. I mean, the really hard work that went into the projects to do the data analysis, to work with different stakeholders, to work with each other, even in person, it, that could be difficult. I mean, if you don't know each other initially, if you're not friends initially, for a group of five people to come together and work. And then digitally, digitally um, it's all the more challenging. You did that very successfully, but then to present the results to a wide audience that has different levels of, of expertise and knowledge, um, you, you're, it's the, you have to cater to a very large crowd and you did it so well. I mean, to communicate all the work that you did, 
um, was so impressive and I can imagine took as much work as the project itself. But communications is a very, very key aspect of being effective in solutions to big global challenges. So kudos to you for that. Um, so my takeaways are so impressed with the teamwork, the creativity and problem solving, keeping focused on the purpose, effective communication and collaboration with each other and external stakeholders in your communities and in the companies you worked with, working with each other, coming up with actionable conclusions, presenting them in a way that we can understand, that we can learn from. I'm gonna call my DPW and ask about pay as you go trash pickup because those charts were so compelling. Um, so I would say to all the green team members, keep questioning, keep your curiosity as it is today. Keep those really insightful, thoughtful questions coming and then the commitment to answering those questions in a team, finding others that come from different backgrounds and working together. Build off the skills that you demonstrate that you have today. Today you've demonstrated you have the skills to be effective and have long-term impact. I'm, I'm so looking forward to seeing what you all do um, in the future. I'm happy to be a resource. And I really, really thank you for inviting me today to be a part of this. It was really inspiring for me. I learned a lot. And um, with that, I won't keep you from, from lunch much longer and I'll hand it over to Amy to close out the event. Thank you so much, Trina Malik, amazing. Um, thank you for that um, very thoughtful and, and hopeful, um, very positive, um, thought going forward because we do try to end on positive note. You know, we, there's so much going on right now with the students came into this program at the beginning and most of the projects address in some way climate change. So that's a big global issue that we're addressing. And then, um, you know, we had a pandemic and they pivoted and they said, okay, I'll, I'll work remotely and we'll figure it out together. And then coming back to climate change, we had a hurricane last night that kind of played out a little differently than what was predicted. And as of yesterday, last night, about two thirds of them had no power and no internet. And um, this morning, half of them didn't have power and internet. And they figured it out. They all found a place where they could pre present to you today. So I am so proud. <laughs> I'm so incredibly proud of the work that they've done and um, the fact that they completed this under all of these conditions. So I, I would say reach out to them, hire them. They are resilient, like you said, and they definitely are the future. Um, I think that they will help us through all of these challenges to see a much, much brighter future. So I'm grateful to them and to our staff who um, have really overcome quite a lot this summer. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending today. We have had amazing hosting organizations and funders and mentors and people that have come in to train the students. We've had um, no less than 50 people come and train the students. So that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and if you want more information about the green teams, please feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in learning more, um, more about the program, how to get involved, how to host a team, how to apply for a team. All of our applications should be coming out in October. Um, either to participate on a team or to host a team. And you can find more at our website at montclair.edu slash ISS. We also have resource information there. Um, anything that is an outcome from the projects that it can be made publicly available um, goes there. And so we have a lot that's still being added into our resources page, but that's where you'll find information. So again, go to our, our um, website and you'll find information there. You can find us on, on social media as well. Um, montclair.edu slash ISS is where you'll find us. So again, I'd like to thank everyone who's contributed. This has been tremendous. Thank you so much and thanks for participating today. I think the future is bright with these students in charge. <laughs>